Good evening, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the ICCF 25 committee for giving me this opportunity to present some of the MFMP's work over these last 11 years and my interpretations in the latter years of what has been found. My name is Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. This is a long-form presentation of the presentation I gave in Stitin in North Poland on the 31st of August and this is now the 3rd of September 2023. So can everyone hear me? Hi, my beautiful wife, Kim. Hi, Louis Navarro, Elias, Lindhart Graham. Hi, Artifact. Hi, Alex, Del Castillo, Gordon Doherty, Corky Oss, the Bippo 5. Join the technicians. It's great to have you here, Tony Jaboni. DIY projects with Chauxis. Definti Ken Pratt. D2105K. Martin Kemp. We have a good quorum. Excellent. Hi, TP Sven. Hi, Lena for you. Hi, Hank Uren. Excellent. We have a good proportion of the team here. So, I advised the goers to the conference that they could follow the evolving answered questions and slide descriptions and References following this monkey code here. Monkey, of course, because the sacred geometry looks a bit like a monkey, and so it would. The image you see here on the front slide is of the detail on the Assyrian stella of Shamshi Adad, and it's about 814 before Christ. I took this picture on a visit to the British Museum earlier this year. And it, if you, my guesstimate that it had 48 segments, if you take a half across there, this is a bit broken off here. It's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And as I say, it's broken off. So one can imagine there should be one here. That would make 24. That's a 48 segment. Interestingly, uh, we kind of have the whole lot here. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. This would be 32 on the inside. And this is the variably described as the flying disc of the sky gods or uh, the flying disc. And as I see this, that this is the top view. If you look at this from the side, you have the wings as it were, going out in a sort of more wing shape and a tail feather. But this is looking at the structure at the top, and I believe that whatever way you see this, you will see a circular thing, whether you see it from the side or the top. So that is the title slide described there. This image I took in Hank Uren's barn, or his outhouse rather, earlier this year on the 5th of the 5th at 11.10 in the morning. And it's actually the Vega Dome experiment where he is replicating a simplified uh, interpretation of the sacred geometry, sort of like the central part you would have in a Christian church. It has some hydrogen in there and some low-pressure air and these are typically an M10 nut. This is a long nut. And when you have the hydrogen in there, you get these balls of fire, these structures forming on, this is the anode. The rest of the chamber, including the dome structure, is a cathode. And I took a whole bunch of uh, high frame rate imagery with 
the Sony Alpha camera, which allows me a very right, wide range of bit depth and allows me to look into the plasma. And on this particular 180th of a second shot, I caught this beautiful coherent matter traveling wave, as I like to call them. And it's a pair. And I will show in the report a close-up of this because it is actually at higher resolution than the 1920 you are seeing here by 1080p. The interesting thing here is that this is the distance that is illuminated by the path of the soliton structure as it travels through the environment. And as I briefly tried to get across, there is a strong electric field between here, uh, probably in the several hundreds of volts. And I think Henk could confirm to his best ability what it was at this particular time. The entire chamber is effectively a cathode, except the anode, which you see here. So the whole chamber is effectively pointing towards, electrically speaking, this anode. And the features I try to extremely briefly point out with this coherent matter traveling wave is a one. It does not care about the electric field between here and here or the magnetic field one might imagine is going around it. It's impervious to that. It is not a kinetic trajectory. That is, it's not firing uh, in a sort of ballistic way. You know, you, it's a, like an arc. It's just like a straight line. And it is also, other than it's moving out of the focal plane, it is not um, dispersing or diverging. It is maintaining a singular sort of distance um, now, it may be going towards the camera and slightly uh, getting a bit blurry, and that might also account for the partial change in, possible change in the frequency, apparent frequency, because it's coming closer to the camera. So there we go. Um, this is one of very many that have been captured by Henk Uren, myself, and by Dave Butier in various Vega experiments. And later on, I will re-refer to a similar traveling wave that had cut a mark out of the tungsten that was exposed to Amaza's HHO variety of gas. And that ostensibly comes from the center of one of the yin-yang structures on that tungsten that did the transmutation in a similar way to we saw on an Amaza vibrator plate in 2019 coming from the center of a cavitation spot. So it is my belief that just as you see these things uh, coming out of celestial bodies at the gala uh, galaxy type scale, uh, well, actually, at the um, what is it? The, pulsars or not maybe pulses it's, 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 it's one type of celestial body that has these helical ejections coming out I think it's scale invariant and it comes from the same type of structures so that is explaining the background of the slide and the foreground of the slide is a quote from Martin Fleischmann's interview with Christopher P. Christopher P. Tinsley in Infinite Energy in 1996 and I'll read the whole quote here. I read, read an abbreviated quote back then, but I, uh, during the presentation short. As I told you when we were talking before, we had about four projects which we were working towards. One was to do with gravitation. One was actually to do with the behavior of electrons in metals. We actually started to collect equipment together to investigate the behavior of electrons in metals. So one might argue that this all started with Winston Bostick, but uh, I did say that Bostick's work obviously had some heritage in the work of Nikola Tesla. 
But by 1957, Winston Bostick was making some very bold claims, and he was proposing that what he had observed in his experiments was possibly the basis for the structure of all matter, including subatomic particles, and right up to the formation of galaxies. And his work appeared to find that they could project matter uh, at ultra-fast speeds, uh, 450,000 miles an hour, and he actually suggested this could be a means of propulsion. Now, I also discussed that uh, the work was first done, it says here, at the Liver Livermore Laboratory at the University of California. And the work started in 1948, and the purpose um, set by the Project Sherwood, a project of the Atomic Energy Commission, was for the conversion of the energy of the hydrogen bomb into controlled electrical power. And so the work was being carried out at three major centers, including Princeton University and Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory at Los Alamos, New Mexico. So this is right where the nuclear bomb was developed. And you can see these galaxy-like structures. Now, you can see a multiple of injection points here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But actually, he started off with two. And each of those was a ceramic pass-through with deuterated tungsten wire. And he would shoot a capacitor bank through that deuterated, sorry, titanium wire, not tungsten, titanium. And he would, with about 10,000 amps, do effectively a Tesla disruptive discharge. And this would produce um, atomization and ionization of the titanium and deuterium. It would produce a current loop, and this current loop would grow during the course of the discharge. And then when the discharge concluded, there would be magnetic reconnection on the lower side, and you would get a soliton, which he later identified was hollow, uh, with a probe and you can see the current is going around here and uh, you've got your magnetic field going around now he actually fired a minimum of these two from opposite sides of the chamber and the reason that's important is because you would have a current loop going down this way and you would have a current loop going down the other way so it's a effectively counter rotating current loops and therefore uh, one might imagine when these things came together um, over a magnetic field, they seem to self-organize, but it would be into a torus, and at the minimum level, it was a torus of two tori. At these kind of levels, it's a torus that forms, but of eight tori. So he was effectively making tors of tors, and in that instance, uh, you are effectively getting a... Um, uh, toroidal moment, which he didn't really uh, understand at the time. But anyway, um, it's what he suggested it could produce, which I think is the most interesting things. Now, Shoulders, in his 1987 conclusion to his book, E.V. A Tale of Discovery, uh, which was his precursor work to establishing the term exotic vacuum objects. He concluded, By some irony of fate, we may have folded back upon ourselves and now have accidentally discovered the EV as an ideal monopole oscillator. This oscillator is the perfect generator for vector and scalar potential waves without contamination from either electro or magnetic fields. These waves can be thought of as longitudinal waves in the vacuum. They are largely undetectable by standard E and B detecting means, but are readily accessible to the monopole world. There appears to be an incredibly large number of useful phenomena yet to arise from using potential effects that are not immediately accessible to the force of E and B fields. 
this phase-determined, force-free world will certainly be another chapter somewhere in the future. Now, he came to do this work because he was charged with looking at the findings of one John Kenneth Hutchison from 1979. So he was brought in, I think, around early 80s uh, by basically Hal Puthoff found the money and um, he worked with a colleague of Hal Puthoff, uh, Mr. Little, uh, Scott Little, I think, and they worked for about 10 years before he kind of set up his own lab and continued the work there. Um, but it was that work that led to this EV A Tale of Discovery. And this description here matches very closely to the modern description of an anapole. And this reference segment down here is from a 2016 electromagnetic toroidal excitations in matter and free space in nature materials. And here again it says non-radiating configurations. Such configurations consist of a toroidal dipole represented by a solenoidal solenoid with oscillating poloidal currents. So you have these poloidal currents, okay, and they are oscillating backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And an electric dipole. This is the electric dipole here, represented by a pair of opposite charges, oscillating on the same frequency as the current. So these are going plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, uh, and oscillating alternately, and the uh, poloidal currents are going back, backwards and forwards. With appropriate phase difference and oscillation amplitudes, destructive interference takes place. The combined source does not radiate electromagnetic fields. However, the scalar and vector potentials associated with radiation of these dipoles do not cancel, but instead propagate to the far field. Hence, a non-radiating configuration acts as a source of electromagnetic potentials but not electromagnetic fields. The physical significance and detectability of these potentials are not established and are being actively discussed in the literature. So um, I propose something to deal with this. Now in a paper that I shared previously which I will give a link to in the presentation thereof there are mean square radii of these things and is that the vanishing field zone the event horizon possibly if that is they can be toroidal and they can be up to spherical depending on the structure and the substructures that being said when you have this vanishing field here you literally have absolutely zero magnetic field out here zero electric field out here. Now in my short form presentation that I gave to the ICCF 25 attendees, I said please pay attention to this point because this will explain the observations that you see in the material, the products of the reaction. And so one might imagine, and this always seemed a bit weird to me, why there was always this event horizon on these various structures and why you could have very very pure paramagnetic materials aggregated together as one and then outside you would typically have diamagnetic materials where did they come from and why are, are, are they surrounding these paramagnetic materials what is going on well, I think when you understand this fully, you will understand totally why these things occur in that way. Right, now I'm going to play Mr. Tom Bearden, sadly departed, uh, chiming in on as if he was uh, listening to this part of the presentation. Also, there's one other thing we must say about that. There is emerging in the last few years and has emerged in orthodox science at an advanced level. Uh, what I would say is the very beginning, but it's, it's moving pretty fast, uh, theory of force-free fields. 
And these are getting very close to what Tesla was doing. They haven't added the anti-wave back in yet, but they're getting close. At least they're eliminating the overall force and doing something else with the electromagnetics that remains. So there you have it. Also, there's one... Oh. <laughs> so, um, another person departed uh, this year on April the 4th, my friend and uh, colleague, Neil Crichton Gould, also known as Lion from the reactors that he made. The reason he called them Lion was that he grew up in Africa. He was fluent in Swahili and Latin, actually. And he read profusely. But he was the only person to take on board my suggestion, having seen a diamond in an SEM by Mathieu Vellat in late 2012-2013 on a treated Constantin wire made by Francesco Cellani and run in one of our reactors. So we observe this diamonds, in fact, on the reactor. And I looked into the properties of diamonds and found that they had the highest specific heat capacity and it turns out they have the especially when they are dirty diamonds um, the uh, highest electron emissions and obviously we know they're very hard they have um, uh, very intense ca capability because of their heat capacity effectively um, to support high intensity de Broglie waves uh, sorry Brillouin waves rather and Obviously, they've got carbon in them, and carbon is something that was identified by Tesla as the only thing that can survive etheric matter streams. And in fact, Tesla uh, diamond button lamp was effectively bitumen, which he carbonized, and in that he put diamond dust, you know, diamond bits. And so it was... A substrate of carbon of one type and then you know the full um, diamond structure in there and so you know I, I, at that time obviously I had no idea uh, that the diamagnetic nature of diamond would be so important and then obviously you have the nickel which um, is able to adsorb the um, hydrogen and in this case deuterium and also the uh, dissociation it was only later that I established the importance having visited Francesco Pientelli of its magnetic nature and the fact much later that that could lead to the production of coherent matter because Pientelli was very keen to tell us to load the nickel very very slowly and then go through the Curie point as absolutely quickly as possible and this was kind of included into Neil Crichton Gold's 2017 June experiment because it was sub part post our glow stick experiments so he included that as well, and I reiterated my view on that in a question to a question comment to one of the researchers at ICCF25 that when you have these monoatomic hydrogens, they have a magnetic moment and they bind to the ferromagnetic nickel, and then if you follow the instructions of uh, Francesco, Professor Francesco uh, Piantelli, if you go through the Curie point as absolutely fast as possible, what that does is it releases the same matter, that being protons, at exactly the same time, so they are in phase, and at exactly the same temperature. And particularly if they are trapped, for instance, in little cracks and crevices, 
you are in a sweet spot for producing coherent matter because you can meet these requirements of same thing, same temperature, same phase. And so for quite some time now, and I've said it before, I believe that that is kind of what was going on. So one might imagine that he's producing some coherent matter here in clusters and that they are working together. And I looked, it's actually this bit that broke off from here on the sample. And this is copper magnet wire, effectively. And it's definitely copper oxide down here. And he has a soft iron bolt going all the way down to somewhere around here where you can see this this is where the fuel is uh, but of course it's uh, all the way in in the solenoid heater and the reason that he actually added this copper on here was uh, for no other reason than to provide a thermal bridge between the heater and the um, fused quartz tube uh, which was inside the Cantal heater wire. But it was very fortuitous that he did because um, it revealed something when I looked at it. And um, I thank Lyon uh, for having the courage to share this with the MFMP and to let me have a look at it. Because on there, we found this 2.5 spiral galaxy that I refer to as right chirality because it looks like it's spinning to the right and it's a yang it's a yang because it appears to have broken matter up in the center in these two spots um, the the and I may be wrong about that but that's my uh, current hypothesis this is a three point left chirality so it's spinning to uh, uh, the left um, and uh, I call this a yin because it looks like it's uh, it's creating a bulb of something in there. Here is a four point and a five point. Okay, this is on the crust. So these two here, if I go back to the previous slide, were on this kind of area here. And the other ones were actually on this crust area here. Okay. And so my point to the esteemed gentlemen and ladies at the conference was that Bostic was not mad. The only difference between this and Bostic's is Bostic was actively firing these things at each other and, and forcing them with a magnetic field to um, self-organize, whereas these things are just self-organized themselves without any deliberate act to try and create it. The other thing that was curious to me um, was the particularly on the two level of which this is most relevant that these kind of beams came out and they they were kind of offset from the angle of this they were roughly the same length um and there seemed to be this circular section around here and it took a long time to um find some way of explaining that and maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I have a working hypothesis, uh, which is the sphere um, which these things produce. And these are the disruption beams, which tend to bleed out longer when there are only two. They bleed out shorter, although it's, it kind of works in a different way here when you start to get three. And, and then when you get four, this, it, you know, it's just not, it doesn't work quite the same as you get more of them. Um, and you can see that on the center too. So having looked at those things um, and having the pleasure to visit Suhas Rao Kar's lab a couple of times in 2017, I think on the second visit, this was with um, Dr. George Eagley with me. I was very keen to do some radiation monitoring on this big ultrasonic horn you can see in the water here. You can see the piezo devices up on the top left here, over here, if I wave my thing around. And I had a couple of cameras trained on this, an S7 and a GoPro Hero, I think it's three. And I took some 240 frames per second video. And I captured these, amongst other things, toroidal structures with um, regular spaced kind of influx, 
which were also vortex nature. Um, so it, 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 the overall thing was a vortex, but there were things that were doing vortex things within that overall vortex. And this kind of gave me the first hint that, you know, there was these kind of hydrodynamic structures were, were much more complicated than, the, the, than they first appear and much more interesting and in that they might be very important through this science. So those of that have been following the work, they will recognize um, this image here from Alien Scientist, uh, which is at an angle. Um, I did de-distort the angle here uh, in my work uh, to match something more like this, which is more correctly oriented to the camera. And the other, the, the thing about here is you see this dome of kind of weird kind of green like glow and then this hard line here, then these vortex sections. And this is caused by a smoke ring like this in a darkened room with a spread beam of laser and you can get these things quite easily. And by studying this particular video here, um, it, you can learn a lot about the behavior of how these things interact with each other. And it's quite weird because there's dust particles in the water and they kind of move around. But these things, they move around as if they're it, it, almost like that coherent matter traveling wave in Hank Uren's plasma chamber. These solitons seem to move around and they're, they're completely moving of their own accord regardless of the local flow of the water in which you can observe by the kind of bits of flecks of dust moving around that seem to sort of creep around but these things can go through the water at high speed and also that they will suck each other in and 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 so forth which you can see here so um this is a still frame where where there is some kind of disruption beam that comes down here it's focused at this point and it's pulling something else in and this is not so much soliton like this it's actually two discs and um other people have replicated this kind of observation in other more simpler ultrasonic tanks i gave a slide here and but really didn't discuss much of it um, about how one um creates what's called exotic vacuum objects um, and they're formed by charge separation and particularly a good way is an abrupt dielectric barrier discharge and so you know this can be through uh, say um, aluminium oxide and so you you basically build up the charge to such a degree that you then hit the breakdown of the dielectric and then it goes through the dielectric so it's a very instantaneous rise time of a high um, uh, intense spark and to to do that i mean you you kind of almost have to adjust um uh some properties of space time anyway to do that <laughs> in order to allow that breakdown and you know actually in that same christopher p tinsley interview with martin fleischman he says he does not understand how thermionic diodes work um and Anyway, so Tesla here <clears throat> used an air gap disruptive discharge. This was used also by John Hutchison in his work. Um, so the, the air, in fact, is providing the dielectric barrier. In the case of Adamenko, he did use a aluminium oxide cap. And then he had this plasma switch and an intense discharge into uh, a lump of metal that effectively added as the momentary storage of the charge and um, they did this dielectric ceramic barrier discharge at the Proton 21 lab in the former Soviet isotopic factory just outside of Kiev in the Ukraine and um, they between 2000 and 2006 they conducted 10,000 experiments every single one was successful Every single one produced transmutation and other emissions. And this was transferred to the US in the 210s with a mystery $4 million uh, money being put up to create a thing called Proton Scientific. And then having been validated 
it went to become part of the US fusion program and I've detailed that in length and including the disappearing website um, just one point here Adamenko in 2005 in a newspaper interview in um, the Ukraine was quoted as saying that he believed that dark matter may be involved and it occurs inside these sphere-like structures and in his patent uh, from 2003, I think it is, he is referring to this spherical, hollow, iron-rich uh, structure embedded in the copper plate, the accretion disk. And this was an example of one of these locations where the transmutation would have occurred. He also saw things that behaved very much like a black hole and that persisted in the copper accretion disks and absorbed all of the material fired at it from a iron beam that is part of a secondary iron mass spectrometer. Other ways you can produce these are by any form of turbulence and shear. So there's two examples that I've given in the past and I will give references to those presentations and ref uh, where they came from. The first one was where um, Slobodan Stankovic had taken his HHO generator and used it to burn through uh, a graphite crucible. And he created a little hole through that graphite crucible. And then he continued to fire the um, HHO burning through that hole and he observed the flame going through, but also in the center of the flame, there was a helical beam, very much like the one I showed you on the first slide. And this was presented in ICCF uh, 22 in Azizi uh, and in 2019. And there was a very excited um, Anatoly Klimov in the room who... Um, was quite excited to find out how this occurred because it later turns out that in the following years Anatoly Klimov published his Plasmatron work that was done I think during the Soviet period but also afterwards where they would take a magnetron and heat up some plasma inside a chamber and then they would have an intense spark discharge that would then push that plasma through a polymer capillary tube i.e. something that was rich in carbon and as that came out it produced these various three types of beam and one of them could not be diverted by a Mach 2 airflow uh, and the beams looked exactly like the one that was observed by Slobodan Stankovic and that is exactly like the ones that we produced in the Vega experiments these things which are very similar to those that were produced by Ken Shoulders and caught on his cameras. So um, I believe they're all the same thing. And I imagine if you, and and uh, sorry for the glasses here, um, uh, my other one's broken. They were only three pounds and these are three pounds as well. Um, if you imagine you've got a tube, uh, it's very hard to inject into a tube a gas such that it goes directly through the center. And even if it goes directly through the center, you can imagine there's some vorticity vorticity and turbulence that occurs so you get like a some sort of helical process going on but as it goes through you've got this fluid turbulence that will lead to um coherence and and these fractal toroids in my view uh, just like um it was described by dykehouse in his early 2000s paper on the formation of ball lightning where you can imagine if you have a string of coherent matter uh, or a loop and you roll it and imagine it's a rubber band and you roll it along a table they will it will twist and twist and what he argues is that when it twists um and it goes over so let's say 180 degrees you get like a, a pinch and a, a sausage instability and this causes magnetic reconnection and you end up with a torus at a smaller scale. And because the torus are either EH in terms of the substructure, they will then self-organize into the overall structure. So as, as it goes through the carbon graphite channel by 
um, Slobodan Stankovic, or as the plasma is forced by the explosive discharge through the, I think it's polycarbonate that they used in the plasmatrons of Klimov et al. You have this turbulence going in there, and it leads to formation of the fractal toroid, and that leads to, at the center points of either the overall structure or the substructures, the production of these coherent matter uh, solitons, and then they can come out and uh, appear as they do and don't seem to care about intense forces. They're able to travel at extremely fast speeds, and uh, even as you have. And again, this is what I'm saying. Remember the solitons in the cav uh, cavitator of Suhas Ralka. They don't seem to care about where the water flow is going. Remember the tornado, which I'll show you later, doesn't seem to care about the ambient airflow. In these cases, he has a Mach 2 airflow cutting across the beam, and these things are not diverted by it. They just aren't diverted by it. They just don't see it. So it kind of implies they're a different type of matter. So you get turbulence, obviously, in the tornado, in the wind hex, obviously in the uh, MFMP Ultra experiments, and I talked about uh, Klimov's work, but he also has a device called an inflow plasma vortex. It's very similar to what's being claimed by a group in Portugal called N-Gate, um, in my view. Uh, it gets a COP of between 2 and 10 if he includes material that I will talk about later. Uh, and also you've got plenty of turbulence and vorticity in the GEET. Uh, we've shown that when you impinge uh, HHO in the form of a Mars gas on a tungsten rod, obviously it's got shear forces and turbulence as it hits the rod at an angle, and this evidently produced the required environment for producing one of these structures. And uh, I'm describing here the Kl Klimov and uh, Stankovic work, which I talked about. Now, in the terms of Plasmac, um, this 1973 model of Colloc, which was um, stolen, it would appear, by the Italian Nuclear Energy Authority without credit in their Protosphera um, presentation. If you have a cathode and anode and you're injecting plasma with uh, helicity, and it comes down and you're forcing more and more and more into this restrained environment. The idea by Paul Collock in 1973 was that a, a kind of loop would come out, right? A loop would come out like that, and then it would it would turn 90 degrees, and and and, and then another one would come out, and then come out, and you would have loops and loops and loops and loops on top of the, the each other, and then they would join together into one big powerful torus. I am absolutely certain that is flat out wrong. I'm absolutely certain, and by extension, the ENEA proposal is wrong. And the reason I give is this. In the 1956 paper, I believe it is, by Winston Bostick, he shows that you get these, as he calls them, plasmoids sometimes coming out, and they end up turning into a twisted braid with a rounded end. And in one experiment conducted in a Vega experiment by David Boutlier, he actually, we actually saw that. I analyzed the video he sent me and absolutely the exact same thing as claimed by Bostic occurred. And so what is actually happening is uh, you do get the loop, but the loop twists and it twists 180 degrees and that's when you get your magnetic, oh sorry, it, it, it comes like loop there and it, and it, and it twists and it, 180 degrees and, and then it pinches off into the... Um, and rather than being flat like that... Uh, how shall I put it? I've got my props here. I haven't got my props here. <laughs> rather than having uh, the plasma channel here with a ring to the side, uh, the rings actually form like this, and they have their magnetic moment going through here, which is in line with the magnetic uh, going uh, field going around the main plasma channel and and basically they spin around and another one forms another one forms and it very very rapidly forms a torus of tori and if you can imagine if there's so much helicity injected that this might even happen on the substructure level and so you would end up by it in ken shoulders terms um an electronic structure built at electronic speeds 
Okay, so I believe that that's actually what is going on. Um, I will do a nice animation of that at some point so it is very clear for everyone to understand. Now, the Ushurenko effect, I put this in here because it's one of the ways that Evos form. This is by massive impact. So in the Ushurenko effect, they took effectively a shaped charge and replaced the copper slug with some sand. And they used an explosive using aluminium powder and uh, um, uh, potassium nitrate. Um, and you have a, a small detonator and this fires the sand at... A lump of steel and most of the sound just bounces off as one would expect but curiously some of the sand is able to penetrate up to 30 centimeters into steel and this is called ultra deep penetration it's been replicated many times and um the uh how should we put this um it's been replicated many times and uh it has transmutations and a hollow channel in, along the line. Um, lastly, the any me mechanical impact. So this is a mechanical impact of silicon dioxide with steel, which I guess is mostly iron. But Alexander Shishkin and, and, and Kurals and his colleagues, they have established that for hydrogen, you only need five electron volts. Now, this is very, very curious, and I've talked about this in brief before, but five electron volts is very, very close to the recombination energy of hydrogen. Okay, so that, what's that? It's 4.412 or something. I don't know, but it's very close to five. And you could imagine that if you had a lot of hydrogen uh, coming from uh, HHO or even uh, water forming, um, and it's incredibly intense and applied to a particular area, one might imagine that you have, you know, differences in energy distributions that would lead to some areas to have very, very uh, much or at least exceeding this threshold of 5 EV, which could then properly ionize um, a piece of hydrogen into this, what Shishkin is, and, and, and his colleagues are referring to, the proton, the electron, and this condensed cluster of what they call background neutrinos that presents itself as its own kind of baryon. Okay, so um, the, these are the the points here. In the background, this is a, a Marconi-style transmitter with a spark gap here, uh, early around the turn of 1900. This is in the Neil Creighton Gould archive, and uh, one person was meant to give these to me when he was in Stettin, but didn't. Uh, at least I don't remember he gave them to me. Um, but the, uh, I'm going to put these on the, an SEM. Uh, and because these are around about 120 years plus old, um, that doesn't phase me because I, it, I, I'm i reasonably confident that if this was used in anger, uh, I practically there may well be examples, maybe at a distance down here, of exotic vacuum objects' uh, impact marks. And if so, these would be the very first and oldest exotic vacuum object impact marks ever imaged, uh, long before the uh, SEM was invented. The impact marks on this sample will have been made, so it will be really rather special uh, to have observed these things. So I'm quite excited about doing that um, at some point. Okay, so uh, this is charge separation, and this slide is very simple. Um, firstly, this is a replication of Shaq Paranoff's work, and as part of that, they used uh, some early NVIDIA Tesla uh, style um, GPUs to calculate the space charge distribution on a simulated Mobius strip. And what they see is these, uh, you know, black uh, mushrooms and these white mushrooms as you have the impact of the um, charges moving around. And you also have reflections off the, off the length. And when I was in Helsinki, uh, I actually went to Helsinki to um, find out about the 
um, Ukona Fasara, so and and anything else that they might have had. So here is the Ukona Fasara. Uh, this is Thor's hammer, uh, the best version of it. Uh, it it totally uh, complies with the sacred geometry. It's the most powerful thing in the universe, and um, this part here, which is the head of the vortex and the counter vortex of a minimum two tor structure, um, this, in my view, is what um, is able to change the forward-facing space-time metrics and to allow for all kinds of funky business. Okay, um, this changes the permittivity of, of the vacuum, in my view. And because it changes the permittivity of the vacuum, and permittivity of the vacuum is in the divisor of uh, the Coulomb constant, um, it probably plays a role, possibly, in the way that these things can do uh, funky things with matter. But also, it will change the properties of space such that uh, you can do other things we might like to do. Anyway, um, boring holes going through material as if it wasn't there. Uh, and so that's very interesting. So I wore that during my presentation. I also wore this uh, original shirt that I wore for the many years at the beginning of the project, um, which has uh, one, two, three smoke rings coming into a smoke ring, which is divided into four sections. Now, someone told me that, and they keep telling me that this is a rhino, but, uh, you know, in, in, in the true sense of Rorschach patterns, um, because I was always mocked, like, <laughs> for saying, oh, I'm just seeing things in clouds. Um, uh, I, I see that as my Ukona Pissara there. Uh, uh, someone says it's a rhino. I don't know. I say, that, I say this is an auspicious type structure uh, with four tor sub subsections, and it has the uh, Ukona Pissara in the center. So that's, that's my story, and I'm keeping to it. <laughs> so... Uh, what I saw also in the the Finnish museum, and I will share a video of that when I took this particular image here, um, are these so-called spectacle brooches. And these are from hundreds of years BC. They don't really know when, but a long time before Christ. Um, they're made of bronze, and you can see the absolute perfect uh, structure of... Um, the vortex and anti-vortex on one side and the vortex and anti-vortex on the other side and as we know if you have this configuration it is making a basic fractal toroidal and you have the flux loop here in between the um the the, the yin and the yang uh, one is feeding the other as as it really does the interesting thing down here is they've got uh, three and then three and they've represented these in the opposite, in, in, in a different orientation, but, but, but with the ring and the spot in the center. So, um, you know, is is this just someone, some druid having a pipe dream, or is this some scientist way back when knowing what he was talking about? If this is just hundreds of years BC, we know that this would have been several hundred years after Anaximander. And Anaximander was the first uh, or claimed first inventor of the observational uh, method, the, uh, observing nature to uh, try and understand how it works. And he was the student of Thales who came up with Thales theorem, which is uh, the symbols of our, the symbols of the Masonic uh, order. Um, and anyway, so uh, this is many hundreds of years after they came up with the, the school of architecture um, which gave us the ionic column. And it is because of the ionic column that we have, uh, when Faraday was electrolyzing some uh, fluid, something like cabbage juice, you get red red and, 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 and blue-green or whatever it is on either side, and you get a vortex and a counter-vortex when it's over a magnet. And one of his colleagues came in and said, oh, this is interesting. This uh, this polymath friend of his came in, and this looked like an ionic column, and so that is why ions get their name from the ionic column, and I believe the ionic column got its name <laughs> because of observation of nature and the vortices involved with nature, and also study of ancient Egypt and so forth. So, um, 
it's quite conceivable that someone had some sensible knowledge. Even just pushing a plate into water and seeing the phallico soliton may have inspired these kind of structures. But anyway, they're right on the money. They are exactly the right uh, shape. So let's move on because the next slide is about the Shak Paranoff generator. Uh, I believe the work was done in the 1980s. I think the patent came uh, just after the Cold War, like so many of these patents. Um, but uh, they had in some of their experiments a cone that would appear to be something similar to the Sothic Triangle, quite close to going in of a green plasma going down in a spiral to the center. And I described this in the short form presentation. And they had a, a range of effects occurred, but one of them, you know, where you get these black spots at a distance, I would refer to this as yin, single bar thermal extraction at a distance, extracting the energy from this point into the center of the uh, yeah, Mobius strip. And in this case, this is a yang, and it's projecting energy out. I think the yang is quite complex, uh, and because actually... Shaq Paranoff uh, in his colleagues note that not only is this a sphere, but it has these secondary uh, globes on it, which are kind of half in and half out of the overall main globe with a bright spot in the center. So, you know, this may actually be the result of some overall um, charge structure that's been built up in, in the moment of initiation here or in the treatment beforehand. Okay. So in... In this work, I believe that the phase singularity is the most important thing um, for causing coherence in these type of devices. And this here is a Penrose stair. This overall paper here is from Light Science and Applications uh, and is from 2019. So it would appear that you're going up and up and up and up and up, but you're actually not getting any higher. And that is the basis of this Penrose stair and the, the same thing happens in phase effectively as you go round and round the single surface of a Mobius strip and you get a phase singularity and this actually at the end is the phase diagram of the phase singularity of a vortex soliton so this is actually for a vortex soliton and so that in mind uh, before we get on to the evidence that led me to understand that we are talking about fractal toroidal structures and their moments. Um, essentially, there was this guy called uh, Yakov Zeldovich in 1957, and he uh, came up with a thing called an anapole, which is essentially what we saw much, much earlier, uh, where you have this fall off of the EM field. And the toroidal moment itself was discovered by Vladimirovich Dubovic in the mid-1960s. This is Dubovic on the 29th of March 2018. And unfortunately, he has basically got either Alzheimer's or some other neurodegenerative disease now. And he's incapable of remembering almost anything that he's done, which is unbelievably tragic. Uh, but this is something that we all face. And uh, I'm constantly aware of that. It, it's one of my greatest motivators in, <laughs> that I might actually forget something. So I, I want to get it out the door. So it's, it's, it's there for other people to use. And I didn't waste my time and my life and so forth. Um, so in this paper here, uh, um, recent progress in the thermodynamics of ferroteroidic materials from... Um, 2015 in multi-ferric materials. Uh, they're looking at uh, if you have an electric charge going around a loop, you have a magnetic moment. If you take that subunit and you ad arrange a number of them, at least two, uh, around another loop, you end up with these mag ma magnetic moments going around in a loop, and that gives you your first order toroidal moment. You take that structure and you put it around in a loop and you get your second order toroidal moment, dot, 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 up to these. Okay, And in the Soviet sphere, sphere the, the Russian sphere, they call them super. In uh, the uh, Western sphere, they call them hyper toroidal moments uh, in the literature respectively. But I don't believe that accurately describes the self-similar nature uh, super and hyper they just they, they don't mean much um, but as soon as you say the word fractal you kind of 
you intuitively know that it's a nested one within the other, one within the other, one within the other. Now, almost anyone that talks about toroidal moments are talking about the first order toroidal moment. And all of the magic that can occur with the phase singularity there also occurs at the other levels. And it's much more intense as you go to smaller, smaller toroidal moments. Um, so one has to bear that in mind when one's looking at the overall effect of the bulk toroidal moment compared to the substructure toroidal moment, if it's adequately driven. Now, as I said before, the minimum toroidal moment is just two current loops uh, in a poloidal current loop uh, producing a magnetic moment opposite direction and therefore they're creating a toroidal moment. And one might imagine that this is what you saw in the work of Winston Bostick, okay, the very first two plasmoids coming towards each other and being uh, self-organized in the center of his reactor. In this paper from Science in 2011 called Observation of Orbital Currents in Copper Oxide, you have an oxygen atom in the middle and then you have a current or orbital current here with two copper atoms and in vice versa here creating a loop one way and a loop the other way of current and that produces your um, minimum structure for your toroidal moment and in fact they do say that this is the toroidal moment that comes out of this structure and I argue that uh, and I'm, I, I, I will put on the record here I'm not certain whether the toroidal moment comes down here or, or there but I think the toroidal moment comes up there that is uh, where I'm standing right now and that this is the torsional disruption beam that comes out from below of a basic structure and this is in copper oxide just as we saw in that previous paper in the lion crust okay and the interesting thing is that there's kind of like a hole in this case and from that hole out there comes this tail and the tail is sweeping around copper oxide now copper oxide has a temperature melting point uh, above a thousand degrees so you know why is this not apparently melted at all but this is in this particular area um, seemingly in a fluid state and able to be shifted around in an arc um, this for me was it was always fascinating and obviously I chose this as my symbol to uh, on my blog remoteview.icu it was pondering this and some other structures on Lion and in other work that I'd seen that in uh, early January 2018 <clears throat> I woke up and sketched this on my old Galaxy Note uh, tablet and uh, call this the basic yin o structure yin because it's pulling matter in this is actually a yang because it's pushing doing something with matter here and 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 pushing out the resulting structures over here and manipulating this um, matter as a result this is in my view yin on an amaza gas uh, uh, treated tungsten and uh, this apparently and I need to check again but it, this is a strontium sphere which is not present in the tungsten at the disruption zone here and we have this wavy line which comes up here with this uh, kind of carbonized diamond film maybe um, layer here and then all the elements in the period well m many of the elements in your body in this area but with this very defined line now I said I would uh, point this out and hopefully you can see it but coming out of roughly the center of this side of the yin yang structure you have a line and this is a helical line that's been bored through the center so um, I remember when I saw this and I spoke to Alan at, at the time I said because I'd already seen it earlier in the cavitation spots of Roy Shinamaza and here I am seeing some other magnetohydrodynamic structure interacting with tungsten and causing transmutation within a very very defined zone and out of the center of this one I'm seeing um, a beam that is cutting through with two pairs in a helical pattern um, through the actual tungsten and of course because of the tungsten's curvature it actually leaves the surface of the tungsten so uh, if you can imagine you've got the uh, the curvature of the welding rod and you've got this structure on there and it's firing out this beam it cuts through a, a number of a distance before uh, it 
it, it's going in a straight line so it just leaves the surface but it's it's a little bit after you can see in the frame here and actually what i want to do is put this again under an sem of uh, better quality this was done uh with alan goldwater's uh help in in california in 2019 uh, just days before iccf 22 and this was actually shared in my poster along with other very important uh, samples uh, in, at, at ICCF22. It was in my poster session. But yeah, so this, this is the beam coming out. So I am a firm believer now that these um, beam structures come from the center of these overall toroidal structures. And, and this in itself um, helps me to be sure that the coherent matter is formed in the phase singularity in the center of these uh, sides of the toroidal structures okay so i said this wrong in my presentation this is not in an ultra experiment it is in an ultrasound experiment uh, we've talked about that in many other presentations this is an, is in an ultra experiment creating our monkey face type structure and our arm structure here with the thing goes down here now why do I, I say the arm the arm typically has a line and a spot on this side and what you see with these structures is the carbon on one side you'll see it in many many experiments that we've done you see one side is uh, different from the other and I think when they represented this in the Sanskrit type understanding of the knowledge they they um they noted with this mark and the spot that the fact that you get carbon or something on one side um, which is different from the other and this is what you actually see in my presentation uh, short form I mentioned that this is one of these structures that's collided side on to the fused quartz and uh, it has the one side above and one side below this is what you get uh, with a slight mark between and then this is the overall structure and then the caduceus coming down um, I like this because it shows that it is this two order structure okay uh, again the curvature of the quartz uh, um, means that it leaves the quartz it actually gets fatter and then it gets narrower because the, the 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 curvature of the quartz is falling away i would imagine it would just get wider and wider if it was just on a flat piece of quartz but this is what we have uh, it does show that the period is roughly the same between each twist now um what i what i wanted to clarify is in the presentation i said that they can either land flat on or they can come into the side and i i believe that this is because of their eh eh na na nature at least at that level if we forget about the toroidal moment at this mo at this stage so if you have uh an electric structure at the top level it might land halfway in or if you have an electric uh, structure at the subtor level it might land flat or related to the magnetics and related to whether you're landing on a magnetic surface or whether you're related uh, whether you're landing on uh, um, a dielectric surface so it might be that one one um, one uh, level of structure will land on magnetic surfaces or paramagnetic surfaces one way uh, but the same structure would land uh, uh, or uh, flat on to uh, dielectric surfaces so I think there's something real about that and you know only through a much greater study will we will will we be able to understand that this is the one that i've just showed you uh, on the right hand side we'll talk a bit more about this later but again this is another ultra experiment one but it's the arrangement of materials which is very important and i'm just showing you here that the o schematic uh has within it not only the d4d ratio uh um structure but also the exact ratio of the yin yang and it's produced in experiment so how did i derive the original wheel within a wheel within a wheel well i had this um scale this scale this scale and this scale um on the fracture sample by john hutchison and uh, this additionally here is the indium that was exposed to the um, cavitation 
of uh, Dr. Roy Shinamaza. So <clears throat> what I wanted to see was when I when I when I chose to look at the plates of Roy Shinamaza, I'm looking at cavitation directly on the cavitator. When I'm looking at this indium that was in the fluid of Dr. Roy Shinamaza's cavitation system, I'm looking at something that's either generated by sound traveling through the water or by something that is colliding with this structure. The interesting thing is you have these things which were also identified by Matsumoto in his, some of his experiment with this black thing around the outside. I imagine this is carbon now. I will possibly dig out the sample at some future time or maybe rerun the experiment and see if it is carbon. But I suspect it is carbon. And the reason I suspect it is carbon is because it is diagmagnetic. And the reason it has these hard boundaries, which were also observed by Matsumoto, is that uh, it is very magnetic inside and absolutely zero electromagnetics outside and so the diamagnetic carbon sits exactly on the boundary so this i chose to put this into this overall cover slide here um, for this presentation is because this was roughly the same scale as these ones observed at and which i chose as the minimum fractal layer on the um uh tour with, uh, the um uh wheel within a wheel within a wheel so here is the uh, yang and here is the yin. So we have one at that structure. This is the same structure, but one is at uh, looking top down on the apple core. And this one is looking slightly side on. So you can see the um, apple core here in the center. I'm just going to kill my phrase, face so you can see the, the really miniature one that was on that one. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of side on. And the substructure on here is this one. And then this one becomes the substructure on this very large structure here. And this, it would appear from counting the divisions around here that are observable. This has 48 segments. And so I, a couple of days later, came up with this structure. And um, I mentioned that the zitter bieber gang motion that is talked about with regard to structure of... Um, electrons and other potentially subatomic particles and and matter generally if you take the mat the the n level tor here and you say that it has a toroidal it, it can influence matter with a or light for instance with a toroidal motion and a poloidal motion then you can imagine that if it's the same for each sub tor if you go down to the smallest level it will go toroidally and poloidally a bit, and then it will kind of hand it off to the next one, which will go toroidally and poloidally, and then it will hand it off to the next, toroidally and poloidally, and then you end up with a, a, a vortex uh, uh, soliton going on. And as the, as the fine structure gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the effective resolution of the vortex that goes around on the outside here... Um, uh, gets more and more like a, a pure wave function. I think, and I, I've thought this for a long time, that possibly this is a framework for uh, even an electron on which a photon is moved around with this substructure below. And because if you, and, and the opposite toroidal and poloidal motion would give you your positron, which is the antimatter of an electron. And if you have two of these things colliding, a, you know, a positron and an electron, the substructures unwind each other and uh, you then lose the substructure, uh, which which is what the light is trapped on, and you end up with photons travelling off at 90 degrees to each other. And that is what you observe when you have a positron-electron annihilation. So I think it's relatively trivial to come up with an idea around that. I don't know whether I'm right, but I'm just putting it out there again. So, in this image, I am showing you just some of the very many structures of impact on a fused quartz or a glass uh, anode sheath in Hank Uren's Vega experiments. Here we have a four point. The fourth one is not properly resolved. We have a six point here, and we have a multi point here, and this is the simulation. And over here is the first video that Hank sent me 
of one of these structures. And again, this is not landed flat on like this one, this one, or this one. This is landed on uh, um, with potentially at 50%, you know, is rotated and, and landed on. And if you overlay the sacred geometry structure with the uh, event horizon bubble, you can see that uh, there's this hard line around here. Uh, and you have this fuzzy stuff on the outside. And I think this is some, like, we, we see this in many different places, and I'll talk about this in, in, in the future. But I think this is this glowing area where it's affecting matter, but it's also pulling matter in and, and helping to cohere it into the overall structure. So this is the the fuzzy zone that you see around these things. And we've seen these actually as like twisted matter that comes out and it's iron oxide, but actually in this actual inner layer here, it's like uh, much more homogenous. Okay. So we observed many of these structures and I, I was... Uh, I, lo I lost my worms, <laughs> my words rather, when I was talking about this slide. I said, "These are the, you can imagine these are the substructures. And it's laying down a carbon tail. Uh, and the carbon tail, is, there's, no, there's very little carbon on the outside of this. This is like a really dense carbon. So as this coherent matter structure was collapsing uh, into ordinary matter, um, it has calcium oxide. This is calcium oxide. This is calcium oxide. This is calcium oxide. It's in, it's left a carbon trail here. When this died on here, it's got carbon in the center and it's got carbon all the way around the outside and this is zinc oxide. Carbon all the way around the outside and zinc oxide. Carbon all the way around the outside and zinc over here, okay? The carbon is diamagnetic. The oxygen and the calcium are paramagnetic. Diamagnetic, paramagnetic. Paramagnetic can live within and gets trapped within the toroidal structure because of the intense, absolutely incredibly intense magnetic fields inside here. But there is zero magnetic field outside and so the carbon lives on the outside um, when the, the overall structure is collapsing and any synthesized material is being born or maybe being carried around with it, but it 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 it, it cannot go inside. It's it, it but it goes exactly outside in every case. So you get these wonderful high contrast effects going on. And then in this case we have uh, thirty six, like the inside of the ancient stele. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Maybe if that was 12, this was 1 quarter. This would be um, 48. This is 6 subdivisions on it, though. 6 subdivisions. This looks like it probably is 2. Definitely not more than 3, um, I would suggest. Uh, this one has 3. And this is actually... The ring here is, is about 750 nanometers. The actual sub tor structures here are probably uh, across the the thin angle maybe 200 250 nanometers so this has got three but it's got many segments in its um uh you know overall tor structure now this is actually in the break up of ball lightning which we'll show later all of these structures were observed on the eastern plateau uh, of the uh, Vega Valley. So over on, uh, should we, should, I'll put it there, this area here, this area there, okay, of the Vega Valley. So what's actually happening is these the ball lightning is being formed in the central channel here, and then it's bleeding out here because there's nothing trapping it in this area. That I, I believe that there was probably a larger gap for some reason in this area, so it couldn't form the channels. But the ball lightning that was formed would de destabilized over this area and then we could come out and blow up and give us all these beautiful images. Okay. Um, it was about, I think, 100 hours. Uh, maybe Hank can confirm that. But this is the anode. You can see these regular balls of light on the edge, if I'm showing you it correctly. Here, yeah, these regular balls of light on the anode. And here in the multi-layered cathode, so you had... 
this structure with two bits of brass on top, something which I don't think has really been ever studied uh, 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 apart from this big piece of serendipity. These are the two pieces of brass brass on top and this is the underside of the two pieces of brass so these are half of the mirror of this structure so at some point I will look around and see if I can find these similar structures and the crenellated iron rich balls as well okay so that's how this was uh, generated and just to reiterate Diamagnetic carbon is on the outside. Paramagnetic calcium and oxygen are in the center. It's a very, very distinct pattern emerging. So the very first of these I found on the 22nd of April 2022. It actually found it in a video recording that I was reviewing on the way back from Prague. And I thought, what the is that? And, and I then had to book another session as soon as possible to go back and actually observe many, many, many more structures. Once, once you find one, you know that you can look for them. <laughs> um, and again, it's, it's in a sea of carbon. This is buried in like carbon and, and uh, silicon and stuff, this kind of stuff that gets synthesized from these ball lining. Anyway, so it's buried in there. Uh, this one's broken up a bit uh, here. Some the, some bits have flown off. And you can see that the substructure here is probably four at this level. And then you've got many around there. And you can see the pinching, which was predicted um, uh, here based on the phantom structure. The phantom structure that was on the John Hutchison sample. Now, I'm going to interject here with a concept of, you know, maybe clearer of what an exotic vacuum object may be. Um, when you have a current structure creating, if you go to, in fact, I, I'll just describe what, what's going on in, in this slide first, and then it was probably more appropriate then. So here's the this image, this image, and this image. These three images I sent to the Russians, and they sent back this. Uh, Vladimir uh, Mikhailovich uh, sent this paper within a few hours um, from Zverblis, in the Chemistry of Life Russian peer-reviewed journal from 1995. And just as I had suggested when I came up with my um, three-level basic structure, you have a current loop going around here, uh, producing magnetic. Then you have that, three, three, uh, six of those around, producing a, producing a magnetic loop, and that gives you your electric field. And then you get that structure and you put... Uh, uh, six of those around and then you end up with an electric current going through there uh, supposedly and then a magnetic field so this is exactly how I imagined it um, and then Zverblis, um got this guy called um, Nevesky actually published the paper in the peer-reviewed mainstream electricity Russian journal in 1993 referring to these uh, extraordinary current structures and he described that if you had a wire or a solenoid or a coil of a solenoid, you would only get um, the pointing vector having the energy going off to the side. But if you had a coil of a coil of a coil, you would get a pointing vector that gets closed and you could keep energizing it and keep energizing it. Where that's interesting is, as I described in my presentation they put a flux gate magnetometer or similar into the core here when they were putting 30 hertz through their structure. This is actually a fourth order tor. tor. Um, and they saw this AC 30 hertz magnetic field oscillation recorded. Uh, they then said that, you know, turn off the power, it's still there. Turn off the power and move the device, the, the generator away, and it persists for two days. Now, I think it's the single... Um, tour of a tour of a tour point closed pointing vector that lasts for about two days because this is the same kind of structure that was uh, observed by Leonid Ritzkev in his exploding metal foils underwater changing the magnetic uh, 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 moment of uh, iron 57 uh, for about two days and it's the same kind of structure that was observed by um, Bogdanovich at et al in uh, his plasma flow discharges published in uh, um, long live plasma videos of long live plasma in 2021 and in that instance that was this was uh, produced a glowing torus that moved around uh, 
for about two days on a, on the target metal. In each of those cases, I think they are as a result. Uh, the exact exotic vacuum object is a result of a tour of a tour of a tour structure, a, th a three order structure like the one I have on my slide here. Okay, but I think if you go to the next level and you produce a tour of a tour of a tour of a tour. You have a pointing vector that closes like that, and you have another pointing vector that comes in like that. And if one collapses, it energizes the other, and vice versa. So they can self-oscillate themselves. And this fits closer with the claims of Ken Shoulders that these things can live in, in metals indefinitely. These things can persist as uh, um, long-term stable objects if they're in the right environment. And so I believe that anything above a fourth order tor um, is the kind of thing that will produce these vacuum persistent uh, currents where you have one interlock to, like, interlocking with another. And so they could form a framework which could then be re-excited and re-energized to, to do work. And those might be at the, at, at the center of the exotic vacuum object phenomenon. So... Just to reiterate, I believe, as, as it stands now, that the single tour of a tour of a tour structure will produce uh, structures that can last up for two, up to two days, right? The tour of a tour of a tour of a tour um, fourth order structure can produce persistent structures. And anything above that would be essentially the same. These would be long-term stable structures. Okay. So... Uh, in 1995, J.R. Roth in Fusion Technology, in I think it was May, published that if we could generate a 10 millimeter ball lightning, that it should provide all of the energy for the domestic home. And Hank Urin in this instance had produced a 15 millimeter ball lightning, which seemed to make this part of the highly conductive, both electrically and thermally, copper pipe disappear in two axes and you can see how sharp it is the fall off and this is compliant with what I'm arguing is this um, uh, area inside which there is an intense electromagnetic field but outside there is basically zero and so this non-linear fall off is, is, is a result of this cancelling of the electromagnetic waves produced by the overall um, fractal toroid that will be somewhere in the center of this structure okay we also saw on the boundary layer that there are these tubes that are cut out of the and scalloped out and so uh, it may well be that the surface su structure is itself uh, comprised of uh, substructures of the the macro one that is is um, doing the overall uh, formation here and it might be that they are synthesized in the core and then spat out and then get caught in the field structure and move around on the outside producing this um, layer which is impenetrable to ordinary matter and effectively creates a shield uh, something which I didn't talk about in the presentation but was one of the things that I believe that this can produce it's a, effectively an impenetrable shield with ordinary matter because the the binding energy of the structures is such that it's higher than all normal matter okay but on the just a few microns outside this area you can see where i've got the microscope here we found uh two three four five six and eight as an example in the time that was allotted um uh structures you can see that on the two structure you have the paisley core and and this is of the vortex coming in. You saw very similar thing on large Hutchison samples and the bull burn sample um, from 1986 that we have. And here, this is the three structure here. And again, the three still has a Paisley type mark in. When we get up to the four level, um, we we start to get something that looks a bit more like a square. Okay, here in the center. On the five, meh, mate, is this two or is it this got a bit of detritus in there? This definitely has a bit of detritus in there. When you get to the six level here, uh, if this is a six, then it really does start to look like a hole. It starts to become quite stable. But certainly on the four level, um, we're not seeing uh, 
this kind of offset nature uh, quite so much. Uh, six, I think, would be very advantageous. On the eight, um, it, I don't know whether we're not seeing some sort of substructure forming in the center of this eight structure. So um, six does look optimal to me, uh, actually. Uh, four is the minimum, although two and three will work. And two, in my view, is what you're seeing in a tornado. So that is why you see this kind of a spiral coming in is because if you project this from the tornadic structure up in the cloud level down to the ocean for instance in a water spout what you're seeing is a projection of this overall vortex structure on the ocean surface okay uh, and so because two is the easiest thing to form uh, you need at least two to make this work and um, then then that is what I believe occurs okay so self-organizing clusters uh, and just outside of the cut okay so um, I haven't gone into and did not intend to go into because in the short form presentation I knew I would never even get close to explaining all of the physical data that led me to produce this uh, overall sphere structure and these uh, disruption beams and the preciseness of the um, this disruption beam. There's one point that maybe might not be clear to those people that have been following this work for some time is that the, 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 on the subtor level the disruption beam is where the Sothic triangle actually intersects with the tor level above. Okay, So you can see it's half in and half out. Okay, this is just It was just magic when I put these. I only built the top level and then I shrunk it down so it fitted in here and then and this just intersected and I thought of course that's why it bleeds out. But of course the more that you have of these as a sub tor uh, so like in four you can see that you've got a bleed out in in a six it's very clear that you would get the bleed out but there is a little bit of a twist involved with these things such that um, the more you have then you, you never get to the point of um, uh, it bleeding out before it's caught into the main field of the of the the next tour around and I, th I believe that's kind of what's going on where you have the bleed out going here, you have the bleed out going here, you have the bleed out going here, but when you get to six, I think it's sufficient number um, to produce the very, very stable structures. Um, and I, I don't know whether the Russians in their diagrammatical representation in the Nevesky work knew that, or they just drew six because it looked good, or they didn't want to draw four. I don't know, but certainly when you, if you can imagine you had one here, right one of one of these tours here instead of at 90 degrees you you, you had it at whatever it is 60 degrees um is it right yeah six, three, three, yeah so then you can imagine that the as as the disruption cone comes out it actually starts to interact with the next uh sub tour uh around and so you end up with a much nicer structure anyway i went on to explain that Every single thing that was observed by Bostic Nardi in the conclusion of their 20, how should we put this, uh, 30, mm, uh, 1948, so 32 years of research uh, that was made public can be adequately explained by this structure. Okay. Then I talked about uh, how when I was looking at the NASA paper, uh, on propulsion, which we will look at in a minute, there was this uh, reference, 1976 Japanese laser in nonlinear plasma paper, where they had observed a thousand Tesla field. To put this in context, this is um, 50 times, well, sorry, 20 times bigger than the biggest MIT uh, superconducting magnetic field that they hope to be able to use to create uh, fusion in a tokamak this is 20 times bigger relatively effortlessly with a single pulse and we're talking about resonance structures that can be a much smaller diameter in this 2021 paper which i referred to here you have greater than 1000 tesla in this diagram it says 1.36 thousand tesla and you've got the magnetic field here and the magnetic field through the the middle and on the turbulence plane here, you have something that looks extremely like we have observed in our work. Okay? Uh, and essentially what they show in this paper is that this Smokling-like structure, the 3D electron vortex, 
the smaller it is, the much, much, much higher the magnetic field gets. So this is, let's say, 20-something micron. We're, we're, we're looking at substructures that are easily in the few micron, and, and Ken Shoulder says that he started making them in the one micron scale. So you can imagine that they would have a much, much higher magnetic strength here. And remarkably, the Gion work of 1954 by Jean Wheeler looks very similar. So, uh, And he very specifically says that the whole thing is bound together by a gravity uh, azimuth, okay? And this is a, uh, I, I want to interject a point here by Boyd Bushman. Boyd Bushman took two neodymium magnets and he put them back to back and uh, something similar weight and put these both things in a sphere, carried them up to a, a, a building and got students to drop them 40 times out of 40 times. The ones with the back to the back neodymium magnets with the brass bolt between uh, same weight, same uh, shape, so they, they should reach the same terminal velocity and they, they should have the same acceleration. Of, of course, the one with the magnet in arrived last. I think that that might be potentially because of the interaction with paramagnetic oxygen. Not that it is anti-gravity per se or it's affecting the gravitational field. That being said, uh, Obviously, if you have um, photons going around here, uh, uh, or you know, some uh, these are magnetic fields, it says here, where it says uh, blah blah blah, two waves of equal strength run around the torus in opposite directions to produce a standing wave with the electric field strong in the regions indicated. So, in the regions indicated, these electric fields and magnetic fields strong in the re uh, uh, in the region between magnetic fields. So, it's something like one one might imagine and <clears throat> this gravitational beam. Now, I think it's very, very important to listen to what John Wheeler says in the next clip, which I couldn't show in my presentation. So I'm just going to adjust the audio here so you can hear it. Radiation, a pencil of radiation carries energy with it, and energy has mass. And therefore, a pencil of radiation must exert some attraction on things beside it. What about getting a pencil of radiation curved into a circle so the light goes round and round, then the attraction it exerts is concentrated as if at the center. So what is it that bends this circle this pencil of radiation into the circle, it's the gravitational attraction of the pencil of radiation itself. That was the idea of the geon. Actually, if you think of different possibilities for the size of that geon, bigger or smaller, you find that if it's very big, the energy is low to push the radiation together requires energy, and you climb a hill like the hill of a volcano until you've come to a maximum energy, and then if the pencil of radiation becomes any smaller in size, the energy starts to go down and the thing collapses. So a geon is really an unstable entity. It either blows up into a cloud of radiation traveling away in all directions, or it collapses into a totally collapsed object, something that we today would call a black hole. But that stability analysis I didn't have in mind when I first published this work. Only later did I see that that's the feature that's dominant. But nowadays, I'm attracted with the idea that this pencil of radiation going around in a circle does not have to be light. It could be gravitational waves. And you can have gravitational waves imploding to make a black hole. Boom. So, I have argued that the toroidal moment can interact 
with relic neutrinos which are more mass than all of the luminous and solid matter and plasma channel ch clouds we can see in the environment if that is the case then it complies with the pre-einstein theory of uh, gravity which was one that tesla s ascribed to and that then this gravitational vector that goes through the center here would actually be uh, a flux of relic neutrinos and what he is arguing that if you have a effectively a torus of gravity going around uh, a wave of that material going around that that itself could end up producing a black hole and Ken Shoulders was credited as the man who made black holes and certainly in the work of um, S.V. Adamenko he created something and observed the effects of which he is suggesting uh, is a black hole type object in his system that also created these iron rich uh, spheres in which he said possibly uh, relic neutrinos or in his words dark matter of which relic neutrinos are a component could cause the uh, collapse of matter and so all of these things are entirely consistent and uh, it might be that the stable ones are these ones that are produced by a coil of a coil of a coil of a coil or any n order above that but the simpler ones to produce are um, interacting uh, toroidal moment structures to make at least a, a tour of a tour of a tour or whatever but um, it takes a little bit more effort to make the uh, more complicated structures so uh, I think I think we got something here that is uh, completely lining up with the concepts of John Wheeler, uh, the observations that we have had that um, Bob McElrath had had in 2010 at CERN Theory Group on the nature of gravity being explainable by relic neutrinos, and the work of Alexander Parkamov, and so it all becomes, in my mind, really rather clear to explain the properties that lead uh, and the, the structure that, that leads to the phenomena that is observed. Sure. So on the right hand side you can see what Hent calls a hot tube and this came about by a um, happenstance that uh, occurred and I will talk about it in a later slide but you see this orange spot moving around here and moving here and moving around it's it's more clear at the end and i believe that this is the tail of the tornado moving around just as you might see a tail of a tornado moving around on the ground in um you know weather systems okay so the fractal toroidal moment uh, my belief is its action on matter is as follows and this is non-exhaustive it changes all forms of electron interactions if you have overexcitement of condensed matter nuclei this can result in anomalous glowing trans and transmutation over time and so why I'm saying that is um, uh, Shishkin and et al are saying that normal matter has these clusters of relic neutrinos they call them background neutrinos in there is this kind of baryon shell that has a relationship the symbiotic relationship with the uh, relic neutrino condensate where if it if the matter is slightly unenergized the flux of relic neutrinos through them will have a little bit of energy extracted from them and the slightly depleted uh, um material will be chucked up back into the condensate and rejoin it and the whole condensate of the universe will average itself out very rapidly if um they have too much energy they will go through this uh, condensate shell through the electrons and share the energy with the environment and that is the process by which i think you see this anomalous glowing the 
vacuum currents uh, of the exotic vacuum objects, if they are stable and are within matter and are themselves able to gather energy from the ether, they are effectively accumulators, ether accumulators, and um, they don't have this kind of same kind of sta stability mechanism that an ordinary atom goes on, but they act a bit like their own type of baryon, um, but without the electrons to mediate them. Then they can sit in ordinary matter, trapped, for instance, in the um, free electron cloud that is in metals, the, the metal bond electrons, and... Uh, they might get energized so much or excited so much that they capture matter into their structure and uh, cause the matter to either decay, uh, causing you know pions to be ejected uh, or muons and whatever to cause transmutation uh, of matter locally, or um, they cause matter to come in and, and be fused. Um, so that is this kind of concepts here. Non-thermal plasticity and material flow what I'm saying in here is that this is because the matter, um, the relationship with the electrons or the, the behavior of the electrons is modified to a, to a degree where they flow differently. And you'll see this in a future slide, how I'm going to describe this. Um, this is typically, in my view, in um, dielectrics and, and, and in paramagnetic material and non-magnetic material whereas critical fragmentation occurs in some paramagnetic material but <clears throat> mostly in uh, ferromagnetic material below the Curie point. Um, production capture and coherence of matter waves um, that is again um, these beams that come out and that can produce uh, in my view strange radiation uh, collapse of matter waves into different configurations. So this is where you have matter going in and a range of matter going in and then uh, when the overall structure collapses it produces a different range of matter out. So the electron interactions that are affected by the fractal toroidal moment um, all of them um, and I, what I haven't included here is the uh, behavior of electrons as a component of nuclei but I'm including Casimir forces that is the modification of the electromagnetic vacuum fluctuations by the presence of boundaries such as conducting plates or dielectric materials and as I said earlier the um, Ukonofasara here this area is able to uh, uh, change the permittivity of the vacuum uh, Ken Shoulders referred this as uh, permittivity transitions, and um, that would do that. Uh, Van der Waals forces correlations in the fluctuating polarization of nearby particles. As I've said before, the structures in the 2021 paper I referred to earlier as a laser pulse into a nonlinear plasma, but remember that is just a single pulse. We're talking about resonant structures, but in the single pulse scenario with a 20-something micron structure, or 40 micron structure, I think in that case, possibly, they're talking about 3.2 uh, uh, trillion volts per meter. And so um, you can imagine that that kind of uh, polarization would have a huge effect on the ability of van der Waals forces. It would just, whatever. Polar bonding, such as between water molecules in uh, H and O. And so this is why I am arguing that some HHO generators create water gas uh, at a uh, a non-boiling temperatures, so and this is why I'm saying boil the the calculations that have been done of what ball lightning has done when it's gone into water, and hence the power that's in ball lightning, um, may be missing the point that the the structure itself uh, changes the relationship of polar bonds. And so uh, the molecules of water just separate from each other, but at whatever temperature they're at, uh, um, rather than at 100 degrees or thereabouts. Ionic bonding, positive charged atoms attracted to negative charged atoms, such as in uh, NaCl. Um, it just gets in there and, and rips the, at, the, the elect changes that relationship um, so that, that they're not attracted to each other more than they're attracted or unattracted to the 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 exotic vacuum object, vacuum structure. Um, 
covalent bonding atoms share their outermost electrons diamond right these are the most resistant okay and you have a couple of choices things like boron nitride which was never really available to um tesla uh, uh silicon carbide um which was called carborundum at the time and he, he found that kind of worked but diamond is the most covalent bond you can have and i believe that's why Tesla found it was the most resistant to etheric matter streams. The etheric matter streams uh, probably being these uh, baryonic type clusters of relic neutrinos or something similar or pure uh, vacuum current stable clusters. Okay, so and then metallic including between crystal grains, uh, electrons shared throughout the metal. And this is very important is the way the metallic bond holds metals together. The they're not in the covalent or ionic sense uh, or polar they are like kind of shared between all the metal grains and this when you understand potentially how these structures can affect um the these the behavior of these electrons in the metals which is exactly one of the four things that um martin fleischmann was trying to investigate then you will uh, potentially understand how you can see some weird effects now um, in the background, I will maybe discuss this in a different presentation. I probably will because, uh, um, you know, uh, otherwise I might not be able to go to sleep at home tonight because <laughs> I'll get locked in here. But uh, uh, I was absolutely completely blown away by the difference in the disruption zone in uh, uh, the Henk urine pyramid structure, the, the cardioid infarction sample uh, uh, in the normal brass area and the inside area and you can see in the background here uh, where I've got the uh, microscope sensor in here this regular hexagonal array um, in the background and uh, so you know it is very very special that sample and it's it really exceeded all uh, expectation with the first bit of uh, analysis that I've looked at so some applications here um, Efficient material processing, cutting, grinding, gasification, cold forming, and molding. Now, in all of those cases, we're not looking necessarily at transmuting the material. We're looking at changing the material's properties so we can do what we want on a local level, so that we can do what we want to do with it and then return it to its ordinary stable state by changing the uh, vacuum permittivity or by uh, changing the behavior of electrons in their relationship with uh, the matter that they are uh, associated with. And so uh, th those are probably the most useful applications because they don't necessarily change the actual properties of the material in terms of the elements or whatever. Then we come to element creation, uh, transformation, and including remediation. Uh, and so uh, element creation obviously from um, basic elements this is useful if we go to a planet that only has a few elements and we want all the elements to uh, produce a decent world to live in uh, same for transformation and remediation obviously good for dealing with radioactive materials um, release of hidden energy within matter this hidden energy within matter in the cia released document in 2017 this uh, flight to alpha centauri which they said is the same as cold fusion and the the drive would be the same as that um that would release the energy from within the matter and one kilo of iron would be enough to get you to alpha centauri in six years um and the device that would extract the energy or the system that would extract the energy um, would be the same device that provided the propulsion. Um, I believe it is this fractal toroidal structure and it explains all of the properties that they claimed were possible and note again that they said that this was the same process behind cold fusion in 1992. Well, the hidden energy within matter is these uh, baryonic uh, matter, uh, these... Uh, relic uh, neutrinos these the um uh, what they call background neutrinos in russia um in, with the team that believe this and so uh, this might also explain the hydrogen uh, disassociation association uh, anomaly which was observed by uh, langmuir where what you do is you you attack it you hit it with this over 5 ev split the thing apart you gain the energy and processes from the the hydrogen being split and releasing this 
hidden energy and then when it reforms it regains that and reconstructs that relic neutrino cluster to make the stable atom so and, and this has been described in other texts which I've shared okay uh, condensed matter conversion to other forms of energy so this is uh, releasing the energy that's contained within ordinary matter not just this hidden energy but the the, the normal matter um, by decaying of protons and stuff and, and and David Freiberger described how with a similar treatment on the um, Maxwell equations that you could get these complex charge structures which are the same as the fractal toroidal structures that would lead to a dialgy angle which is what he called that would take baryons and cause them to uh, uh, decouple from the Dirac C on which they are stable uh, this is his statement uh, and cause the decay of those baryons which in my calculations are approximately if you could yield all the energy that comes out of that uh, 133 times more energy than you get from the uh, fusion of deuterium and deuterium and that is otherwise the most significant energy you can get from a, um, uh, a reaction that is known to be possible per nucleon. Uh, communication without barriers, uh, and I will describe that in a minute. Transmission of large power over thin wires, widely reported in the past, but I think we have a concise and uh, accurate replication. Uh, sorry, understanding why that occurs. Propulsion and shielding. I described how the shielding could occur earlier. It was not something that I wanted to go into in too much detail. The image in the background, which I may go over in in another presentation, uh, might briefly go over it here, is. A 1980 circa sample that I was given by um, George Hathaway in December last year and uh, here it is it's the one on this side these are the fragments of the large billet that I previously looked at which is with a collector in Scotland um, and so these are some of those fragments which John Hutchison one of his famous videos was talking about how it was observed at the Max Planck Institute well I have exactly replicated the findings of uh, George Hathaway and extended those with my first session and uh, yeah, it cost $800 a session but uh, I want to spend quite a long time with this sample. I believe I completely understood the the mechanism by which that this was uh, manipulated and it is in line with my proposal on the 6th of January 2018 that was subsequently uh, um, similarly talked about by um, one Salvatore Pai in his uh, US Navy patents. Uh, anyway uh, uh it's it's literally astounding what you see on this sample um firstly you've got like a, a load of tori here that are self-organized on on this crystal grain which look almost exactly like a, a sapphire reactor uh, or one of Hank Uren's Vega reactors with the self-organized tori and you have the same over here and then you have these uh, iron uh, and it's a ferrosilicon sample actually um it turns out uh, split the the actual homogeneous crystal grain is split in lines okay and um uh, this is you know it, tom bearden describes a analysis i think they did in the 1990s of this sample and then what was so surprising to me is that i had this sample imaging done the week before and iramura from uh at tohoku universities uh, on the 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 nido the the japanese nuclear uh, team they showed that in regular arrays they get these spots of oxygen rich material now this is carbon and oxygen rich in my my view but i need to do further studies because i only had a few minutes with the sample um and uh, I, it looks very very similar to what they observed but they see they see a higher excess heat in samples that express this kind of arrangement and so this is absolute phenomenal because you have one of the world leading teams um, that are observing something similar to what was observed uh, on a sample from mm, circa 1980 by John Hutchison. So what I'm now going to do is play the second clip of Tom Bearden here. So you just bear with me. Gravitational potential is made when electromagnetic forces fight themselves to a draw. When, in other words, the gradients become zero. The... Uh, the gradient vectors are the resultant become zero, but the two forces are still in there slugging it out. All the energy is still going. The work is still going, but it's trapped locally. That's internal energy. That's what gravity is. Another thing you do with such a thing is you cause 
uh, the magnetostatic potential to change a vacuum. In other words, that's pole, an unfortunate name of magnetism. But uh, in other words, it causes deposits of monopoles inside uh, materials such as metals. And you'll literally have the monopoles repel each other, and you'll have the explosive separation of metals into all kinds of grains and structures according to the waves. And uh, another thing it does, since this stuff comes from the nucleus out, it doesn't go through the electron shells. Its medium is the nuclei. Uh, what you have then is you have changes in the atomic nuclei and which result in lattice changes. You have the production of alloys, which cannot be made in this world, normal processes. Another thing you have is uh, once charged with scalar radiation, the, the nuclei then continue to discharge over a long period of time. And so the material continues to change, alloy form and so forth, over a period of even a year. So he talked about the sample splitting in sp uh, like what looks like Venetian blinds. Well, that's exactly what you observe. He talks about these things arranging themselves, these monopoles, and tearing the matter apart. That's exactly what you observe. And uh, he says it does not go through the, uh, the electron shells. Okay, so this just goes into the nucleus. Now, these things themselves... Uh, obviously capture they seem to capture material and then they get themselves into a state where they can be energized and energized and energized and then they can do work inside here where they're not losing any electromagnetic energy and producing fantastic fields and fantastic uh, uh, both electron electro and, and magnetic fields um, but what I've shown is that sometimes the um, vacuum currents that form in the center apparently seem to object and are they carrying matter with them potentially if that's the co coherent matter wave the strange radiation that come out and then it goes into metals and it gets some sort of relationship with the electrons in the metals if it is a vacuum current that is both uh, uh, is like at least a a fourth order structure with a with a uh, interlocking uh, vacuum current then these could persist in the material and maybe they, they interact with each other. And this might be something that might one might refer to as scalar uh, energy caught in there. And this may be where my understanding departs from where Tom Bearden is in, in that we can see these things coming out of these structures. And is this the type of radiation that, that does really, really funky work? Because when we see it going through ordinary matter, it can just instantaneously bore a channel through it, like instantaneously. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, this is kind of where my thinking is right now. But I think the most important thing here is it doesn't go through the electron shells and that it can persist in matter and change that matter over a period of time and it produces monopole structures all these the kind of things we've observed and it was just beautiful because i i did this imaging last week and uh, uh, the week before the presentation and on the weekend when i was kind of put, putting the last kind of slides together i came across this video that i managed to capture from um uh george hathaway when i was wet there i hadn't had a chance to review it because uh, I had so much to do, I'd like set it off in the background with, with it down silent and, and I would be scanning documents. Uh, um, and so it was just amazing to see his words match uh, his words based on his analysis of this same sample, fragments of the same sample, match exactly what I was observing. And then even more exciting during the week to see the same kind of observations by Iwamura in a cold fusion experiment. Gravitational. Okay, so uh, the challenges with the fractal toroidal moment and this area of technology is non-thermal but ye yellow-orange glowing reactor containment failure. Uh, warnings given about false radiation detection given to the cold fusion community, the ICCF, uh, in 1995 by Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. Uh, warnings given at ICCF-10 by Ken Shoulders in 2004 and Alexander Shishkin in 2018 in Sochi, so which I made a, a, a very obvious that this was being warned about. So false radiation, fake neutrons that, that, that can fool three, three helium and 10 boron detectors, particularly 10 boron, and fake photons that bind to photosites in scintillators, the kind of scintillators that are used for detecting X-rays and uh, gamma rays. Um, so you can't really use these things. You, you need to use um, either a, a modified 
uh, boron detector as per Alexander Shishkin's device, which I've described. Or um, you can use, um, uh, what is it, like indium or um, gold activation and, and look at the um, decay products uh, by proxy. Semiconductor interference, specifically NP junction, and this causes computers to fail and, and so on. Um, but you could possibly use this. It, I, I think it's like a Kozarev type detector. But anyway, um, it's used by, um, I think it's a reverse biased uh, diode. Particularly types of diode can give a variation in signal um, when they're exposed to the flux of this radiation. And so it's possibly a simple detection method. Um, uh, obviously, if these things when they blow up they produce electromagnetic pulses i believe we witnessed one in gs 5.2 and uh, also the traveling cluster damage to electrons in particular uh, electronics rather um oh sorry um anything using the josephson effect such as superconducting quantum interference devices squids quantum bits qubits or rapid single flux quantum devices all of these devices will be used in AI, super, uh, super, super AI uh, technology. And um, therefore, when the AI apocalypse happens, it's the super toroidal moment that will save us. Uh, just uh, putting that out there. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing about these things that use a Josephson effect, uh, these could effectively be used as detectors for the presence of the toroidal moments, uh, scalar and vector potential variations. And therefore, I am proposing and proposed to the ICCF community that rather than using these devices, which all can get affected and so on, you can actually use uh, uh, some kind of Josephson effect device uh, to uh, m be a detector for the output uh, of a working reactor. And I have asked someone who's at Cambridge, who was at the conference, to set me up with a meeting with J Brian Josephson to try and find the most simple um, device that can be generated that could be used as a detector for uh, fusion. Uh, and fission and all these effects that occur by the fractal toroidal moment. Um, the image that I'm showing you there in the top right is Vladimir Dubovic in the beginning of 2018, taken from the same video that I took the last shot from. <clears throat> and he's warning people, this is following the death of Yuzhi Bajatov. Uh, he's warning people uh, that uh, if you actually get an active structure uh it can literally suck the life force out of you and and people need to be aware that, that, that this can happen um so uh, there we go um right so we're, we're now full into the applications now uh, now you've had your grounding and this actually shouldn't take too long to go for it through because they're fairly self-explanatory because they either exist or they are well documented um so uh, in this video from the 11th of February 2022, uh, the, um, Hal Putoff is talking to Eric Weinstein and they are talking about how to get around the uh, laws uh, created by relativity and so forth by uh, Albert Einstein. And Eric Weinstein describes using the exact same Penrose, Penrose stairs diagram that I showed you earlier uh, about how the Aronhoff bomb effect uh, is the only thing from 1954, the only thing in physics that gives a potential to um, circumvent these rules which uh, prevent us from going faster than light. So they're talking about some sort of intergalactic drive. And Hal Putoff replies to Eric Weinstein following his explanation of the potential for the Aronhoff bomb effect to uh, enable circumventing these rules. And he's and, and and Hal says, and you can go way beyond that, i.e. the Aronhoff bomb effect. So there, there are all kinds of toroidal geometries, for example, where you have no electromagnetic fields whatsoever, but you have strong vector scalar fields. And since you have no Lorentz force in the absence of E and B, then how can you detect them? Well, you detect them by the by any kind of quantum detector that can detect phase shifts. Can, they can detect the vector scalar potential even in the absence of fields. 
So there's a whole engineering approach concerning which I have two patents, by the way, and have started a new company that involves only dealing with vector and scalar potentials. Now, I looked into the patents and one patent here is communication method and apparatus with signals comprising scalar and vector potentials without electromagnetic fields. This is the patent and it's from 1993. And clearly from this drawing, clearly from this drawing, in case you missed what was on there, that's the YouTube link because I had my mugshot in the way. Clearly from this drawing, you can see that you have two uh, tors uh, which are solenoids. So solenoid tors, another solenoid tor. Um, this one has the coil going around that way, and this one has the coil going around that way. So this is, and it's only it's accurately shown on this side, but not shown on this side. But um, essentially, I believe one's going one way, and one's going the other way, and therefore you have a basic fractal toroid, and you have a electric plate here, an electric plate here to create your oscillating electric field. This is to create your signal generator. And then he says the magnetic fields that circulate with toroidal coils 885 and 87, 85 and 87, are at right angles to the electric field established between screens 81 and 83. So that the vector potential and electrodynamics fields derived from the toroidal coils and the electric fields derived from the screens can, if pro properly phased and adjusted to the correct amplitude, interact to produce time-varying vector and scalar potential signals without producing an electromagnetic field. Okay, so he's creating a, a virtual macro anapole, and he is in the same patent saying that the detector would use the Josephson effect. Okay, now, as I said in my short form presentation, Harold Puthoff, just in 1992, transferred the psychic spy program to Science Applications International Corporation. That is my understanding. I might be wrong, but that's as I understand it. And here we are in the year later talking about something. Now, I described in my presentation that I felt weird, genuinely, it's on record in uh, when we were doing the glow stick experiments, that I felt weird next to the uh, glow stick experiment. And I actually felt weird and do feel weird uh, when I'm next to um, Hank Guren's experiment sometimes, uh, when I'm next to other plasma experiments, even with HHO, and also weird when I'm next to high intensity cavitation experiments. And I am electrosensitive, and I've discussed that before. But I'm convinced that these processes are doing something that's similar to uh, what goes on in the brain. I've argued that uh, a number of times. And then uh, some kind person, which I will find who sent it to me and put it in the reference sheet, um, found me this uh, publication that came in Nature Human Be Behavior in 2023, in June, uh, the middle of June 2023. Interacting spiral wave patterns underlie complex brain dynamics and are related to cognitive processing. So during cognitive processing, this whole map of the brain here, which is projected out over here, you can see how the sections work, then they find these, this is the phase diagram that they calculate, and you have vortices and anti-vortices, and these are magnetic vortices, and they are determined by functional magnetic resonance imaging, and fun functional magnetic resonance imaging works because hemoglobin that is deoxygenated is magnetic and hemoglobin that's oxygenated is diamagnetic and so uh, um, you this is how they're calculating them but yes this is to do with cognition if you're cognitive then you're able to do cognitive tasks one can relatively easily assume that you are conscious therefore in the conscious brain you are when working with consciousness you are producing uh vortex and anti-vortex and whether you like it or not whether you have an opinion or not this will produce a toroidal moment so that is that so there we have something that is um uh connected uh uh, and did 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 Hal Puthoff work out this long before it was studied over here? I don't know. But what I can say is that um, in the fourth chapter of Alexander Parkamov's book, Space, Earth, Human, he reveals prior work to his cold fusion or Lena work uh, and his discovery of N-radiation or these relic neutrino fluxes. 
that he was doing the psychic spy program for the Soviet Union. So here we have two people that end up on the periphery of um, energy research that previously were looking at uh, the psychological phenomena. <clears throat> so uh, one which has been very fascinating for people for many years is Tesla's cold electricity. Um, the transmission of many kilowatts over eight micron wire was demonstrated to a team that Tom Bearden sent to Moscow in 1992, along with cold metal forming. This was independently discovered in 1996 by Dr. Takaki Matsumoto and shared at ICCF6 in Toya in Japan. And he says a new kind of electric current was observed as the flow of these tiny ball lightning. By the element analysis with SEM EDX of deposited material on the surface of thin copper wire, which connected a discharge cell and electric power supply, the transport of tiny ball lightning was proven. Materials as well as electrical charges were driven by the new current. So, actual elements were shifted along with this electrical current it, he observed carbon deposits where these structures broke up this is in t and he actually observed the tiny ball lightning moving right um and so they they uh he essentially proved this and i have a video somewhere i couldn't find it i was going to include it but it didn't really matter i knew i didn't have enough time so i have a video of a um early 2000s russian television news article somewhere i will find it at some point and then it will become part of the resources shishkin additionally argues that transmission uh, over coherent light beam um, is possible of these clusters and that this is how laser lena is triggered right so this is mori king's harvesting plasmoid energy presentation where he's talking about the vacuum polarization vortex ring. So it does vacuum polarization. I've discussed how that does that. Um, it is a vortex ring. Yes, it is. Maury King is talking about Ken Shoulders plasmoids, and he's showing how cold current works. It goes along the thing. And here is his diagram of the plasmoid ring. And that is highly, highly, highly significantly similar to the structure from the Zverbliss 1995 paper. I believe this is the same thing. It's the same thing as Tesla's cold electricity. It is the same thing as uh, uh, demonstrated to Tom Bearden in, in Moscow in 1992. And it is the same thing independently discovered by Ta Dr. Takeki Matsumoto, God rest his soul. Okay, and this was in uh, Discovery of New Kind of Electrical Current. And he found carbon deposits at the end of the path, as I discussed earlier. So uh, we've been replicating this. Uh, Tony Giaboni uh, and Henk have been spearheading this program. Um, and uh, th this is moving forward as, as, uh, um, as and when. Uh, but it uses the sacred geometry here. And um, it's this uh, Paisley type structure that I was descri describing earlier. And I've argued that, that because it has this moment, it's it may be introducing this flux of uh, relic neutrinos or something, or, or or it's just changing the way that the electrons can behave uh, at these this particular zone here, uh, meaning that you can have wind or wet waves or whatever that are completely independently moving of the high speed uh, mo movement of the water on the surface here. This, in my view, is dehydrating by removing the bond relationship between the polar bonds in water and uh, making it very easy to dehydrate without having to boil it, although it is high temperature in the devices that they used, but it would assist the process. And also, um, uh, since there are um, covalent bonds uh, in things like quartz, uh, and metal bonds, obviously, in aluminium, it is affecting those both of those kind of bonds to assist in the process. Um, uh, we haven't hit the 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 nail yet, to, um, um, but we hope to at some point. So this is the same thing, and in 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 uh, Tony Giaboni's uh, version, we have four uh, attempts at producing the subtor structures overall, the uh, creating the 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 bulk toroidal moment now in this paper field resonance propulsion concept national aeronautics and space in, in administration nasa to you and i um there is this uh a ac halt in 1979 
concluded that they could create an intergalactic drive. Uh, it was a propulsion concept. And their diagram exactly is a current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop um, which in incidentally they intended to produce these things with, with lasers. Um, and that this, uh, from 1977 or six work, um, you get magnetic flux recon uh, reconnection and it produces a torus, um, uh, sorry, a vortex in the center here that would necessarily go out in a cone and this is producing the effect and it's exactly the same thing as you can see again with this particular structure here. Uh, this was a new one. Actually, Tony Jaboni mentioned this interesting technology just by the by uh, when we were doing the initial uh, wind hex um, uh, uh, tests. And I immediately uh, recognized that it might be the same thing. And I set up a meeting with a company uh, called Travelling Wire um, in the UK, about two minutes from where I used to live for nine years in Burgess Hill. And um, uh, my concept was that uh, in, in this Mori King uh, slide. He is talking about his time with uh, Ken Shoulders, and Ken Shoulders described how the most powerful thing he ever did was to take a ceramic block, a dielectric, and pass an EV through a borehole with water going through it. And I would suggest that the EV, which is a single tour, right, a uh, single tour produced from his, let's say, his. Um, uh, what is it, uh, his uh, wetted mercury uh, tungsten or just a tungsten electrode with a pulse on it. That's that's kind of a single tour. So like you, you've got a, a spike there and the electrons are coming off and you've got a vortex. So it, you're getting the, the basic uh, toroidal moment. I suggest that when it goes through here with the vortex of water, that the extra helicity and turbulence that is introduced in the process of being passed through this uh, hole with this ceramic block um, cause is this kind of rubber band divisioning of the plasmoid structure so that it makes a much more intense fractal toroidal structure uh, with smaller sub tors within it and he said that the device and, and, and also it, it might be disassociating the water in terms of both removing the uh, the ionic bonds and then disassociating the water and then gathering hydrogen and, and the oxygen, which is the anchor, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, and this this goes through here. And uh, he said that this was completely uncontrollable. He had no idea how to harness the destructive power that this caused. Literally no idea. And when you think about it, this is very similar to Tesla's 1936, I think it was, uh, um, paper um, where he had a, a, mer a mercury or a tungsten wire being fed into an open-ended uh, dry steam created uh, vacuum tube and um, uh, he produced these electrical particles of matter that then shot themselves through dry steam so it's relatively similar to to this but anyway um, that that is that is the device and when I saw this What's happening with a wire discharge machining is you have a, in this case, you can see that this is, um, well, maybe you can't see because of the Microsoft bits that they put down here, but uh, it's 300 microns, so it's 300 microns that length, so it's about 250 micron, this wire, and it's brass, so it's copper and zinc. Brass, we know it's got these wonderful properties uh, for this process. It can actually cut tungsten carbide. That's how incredible this process is. And you change the pulse rate, the energy, and the flow, and, and the speed of the wire going through. And you can e actually see that it chops off a section of the wire, in, and it produces these scallops. And these scallops, I believe, will be the same exact type scallops that you, will, you have when uh, you have these balls produced in plasma, and they, they eat away at things. Okay? And what happens is, as this wire goes through and it's fed from the top to the bottom, it also feeds a jet of water that goes through the crack. So, on the surface of the brass, right from the top here, edge, you get a spark. The spark will, and actually they design this, so firstly it's dielectric water, okay? So, or, or they, they use a synthetic oil as well, but let's say dielectric water, it's deionized, 
so it, it is a dielectric barrier. So this is a dielectric barrier discharge. They actually do the charge so it does not form an arc. It only produces something. And this was actually developed by some Russians in the 1920s. And even today, they, they, they still don't really know how it works. But what they do know is if they don't feed the wire fast enough or if they give it too much current, the wire breaks, right? So it's about finding a balance between getting the, 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 the energy in the pulses right uh, and you end up with these scallops taken out. We've seen these scallops in Hutchison samples. We've seen these scallops in the plasma reactor of uh, uh, Vega reactor of Henk Urin and so forth. So the scallops are taken out. And um, uh, if you, they're not asking for a discharge. So electronic structures built at electronic speeds. I would suspect 100% certainly that it is producing exotic vacuum object structures and it is water being shot through a thin channel uh, around this. So it is effectively doing what Ken Shoulders found was his way to produce the most energetic effect he ever observed. And so uh, for me, it was a no-brainer. I had to go and get some samples. So I asked him, I've actually got other samples. And I, like I say, I had about like six minutes or something to test this sample. I want to go back and I've got much more sample to test. Uh, in fact, I've got a, a large amount of it and, and I've got it cut, cut, cutting aluminium. This is brass cutting aluminium because I wanted to see the contrast and I have brass cutting brass so I, I can know if it's, you know, synthesizing something interesting. Anyway, literally within that six, six minutes, I did about two or three minutes taking this and, uh, and the, the balance on one sample and it, it, it took me like two or three minutes and immediately I found what I called the, the flying spaghetti monster. And I call it the flying spaghetti monster because it has two eyes and a tangle thing. And some of these structures has, has these uh, noodles that come off the side. And I just think it's funny ever since I read the, the uh, thesis behind the flying spaghetti monster in Alan Goldwater's Magic Sound Lab. That actually it's funny that, that actually the world might all be controlled by something that looks like the flying spaghetti monster. Which is just hilarious. But anyway... Um, this is, uh, as far as I remember, a zinc sphere um, based that is the brightest metal in the combination because we have aluminium, uh, copper, and uh, uh, sorry, brass. So, uh, so it's a uh, copper and zinc and aluminium. So this is the brightest metals. This is a sphere of zinc. We see zinc on one side in the ten yen coin, uh, in uh, with a Mars gas exposed to it, which Mars gas is electrically dissociated oxyhydrogen. Uh, and so that is exactly what's going on here. We're creating HHO and then burning it. It's the same thing, same thing as much Lena experiments. And then we see this wavy tail that comes up to the center point, which is in the center line here. And then we see carbon mostly on one side. Okay, um, so I, this might even be a carbon, uh, a, a copper ball that's actually covered in a lot of carbon because the carbon comes out. We see this carbon over, uh, over to one side all of the time. And I believe that possibly... That this is, as I said earlier, why on the OM symbol you have the curve section and a spot on, on one side of, of the overall OM. Okay, but there we go. It literally took me three minutes of effort to find the structure. So I want to spend a lot longer on SEM with more of these samples with the other uh, metals that I cut. Um, but, you, you know, already um, it, we're on to a winner. So. Um, now on the uh, there's two other types of cutting <clears throat> which work and don't work. One 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 on the left doesn't work because you're using a paramagnetic, highly conductive metal which is heavy, and it also has fourteen something percent spin isotope. Right, so those a dynamite combination when the HHO comes in and it creates creates either this. Um, uh, this in it really interesting uh, baryonic uh, clusters of relic neutrinos, or um, uh, it, it's uh, um, whatever it is transmuting it into all of the elements in in your body, uh, and we got our strontium sphere and the carbon again with this wavy line. So we got the wave wavy line here with the carbon. We've got on one side, so the the wavy line and the carbon on one side the wavy line and the carbon on one side um, coming into the main structure which is always a bit lopsided um, 
uh, this is causing it to fission, okay? Because it can. Because it the binding energy of the fission products is higher than the binding energy of the tungsten, okay? And so it's energetically favorable to do that. And again, you have your uh, uh, vortex pair coming out here. In the case of this video, which I'm going to play for you, which I could not play in the short form presentation, it is HHO gas uh, cutting through a thick lump of mild steel. Mild steel is basically iron and carbon. Iron is obviously, as you know, um, ferromagnetic. Carbon is diamagnetic. But the thing is that carbon, as we showed in HHO work, is it, it kind of interferes with the coherence and it, it thermalizes some of it. And so I believe it's actually because carbon forms these... Um, uh, benzene rings and the benzene rings have these delocalized electrons above and below and they interact with the toroidal moment and so on and that's a whole other uh, thesis that uh, I, I want to present but as as it's cutting through here and I will show this now um, it's really really quite spectacular so in this case there's nothing to transmute to iron is the main one of the main products of HHO and of Lena and carbon is one of the main products of HHO and Lena. So it's perfectly good for cutting iron. And what happens is, before I play the video, is the HHA comes down. Uh, it produces the coherent matter, possibly with this hidden energy within matter uh, released. And uh, this etheric cl matter clusters in there. But whatever, it's in this vortex. It, cr it creates this. It's going into a capillary. And it creates, and it's basically a very slow Usherenko effect. <laughs> it's a very deliberate and slow Usherenko effect. I I found this sample, this video, which was you know cutting a piece that's maybe a foot thick. Um, there are other videos where it's cutting like half a meter or even more. Um, I I don't see there really being any problem because like it's pushing into the channel. Um, but what you are looking in this video is pretty much the same thing as you are looking in this. This is just like very controlled method. This, in my view, is HHO doing its uh, disruption of the way metal bonds hold together and uh, possibly even causing some transmutation. But I will have to look. But I, I don't... Because it isn't doing the same thing in the same place too much, it's probably not doing transmutation. It's just using the toroidal moment to do work. So I'm going to play this video now. That's the water going in.
What you'll notice about that is actually that there is a piece of similarly thickness steel just below the uh, the other piece that he's cutting. And it is basically, they're not worried about it being affected at all. And the way I look at that is that even if it's just like a half inch gap or an inch gap, the coherence is com the, of the solenoid is completely broke, of, of the um, uh, toroidal structure is completely broken up. And so it just comes out and, and it doesn't cut the piece below. So um, fairly, fairly trivial to understand how that doesn't uh, do the work. Now, this whole shearing process is exactly what um, Bogdanovich is showing when he's creating his long-lived plasmoids because he's actually passing a water jet with electrical discharge uh, through it onto water, so uh, on, onto a flat plane. So he's creating HHO and he's got the shear, shear effect uh, with the high-speed shear. And so it's, it's essentially what he's doing, except uh, in, in this case, you are... Um, already got HHO and you are hitting a flat surface with extreme shear. So if you saw at the beginning of the video, he actually literally has the, the jet almost exactly above. So the, the, the jet is coming out and going sideways. This produces a toroid. 100% it produces the charge separation. It forms the clusters. 100% certainly. And there are papers that will discuss that as well. Um, uh, and, and essentially, much of, I reiterate again until I'm blue in the face, much of what is considered then is actually HHO. And I said that a couple of times during the, the, the week. And it's like, you, you don't even get a rise out of them. It's because like, you know, <laughs> the work of um, Martin Fleischmann is HHO. The work of Mizuno is HHO. It's like, okay. Um so yeah, the shear forces lead to the soliton and uh, the, the disappearance of, te uh, of uh, tungsten was observed by Tesla in the late 1800s to early 1900s. It was observed by, um, uh, I think it was observed by um, Langmuir. Uh, Hudson observed it, uh, David Hudson in 1980s, uh, Dadahako Mizuno in 1990s, I think 94 or 96, he had eight, a COP of 800, uh, and it was the tungsten that was providing a sapphire project from 2010 onwards, and, and the MFMP has observed this in this image you can see on uh, Amaza uh, gas and in Vega 2020 experiments with Henke and, and also um, a oxyhydrogen gas uh, produced by um, uh, David Boutlier. Um now, when you when you understand this, you understand that because gold, silver, and copper are diamagnetic, they're not really fuels. They're they're a product, which is good. <laughs> um, I mean, everything will be eaten if you push it to the limit. Um, but what uh, you know, I have found is that, that that tungsten and aluminium are genuinely fuels. They're both highly conductive, and they're both. Um, uh, um, paramagnetic which means that they can go into the structure with ease they want to go into the structure and they become you know part of the action as it were much much easier than diamagnetic materials magnesium also falls into this uh, bracket uh, but of course magnesium will burn in air so it be uh, very very easily so it, it's got its own issues but magnesium and aluminium were two of the most preferred elements for uh, um uh, Tesla uh, to use to create his etheric matter. Certainly, there are only two that were non-toxic that were suitable, and he used tungsten, as I said before, in his electrical particles and matter gun uh, that he proposed in the 1930s. And so, um, it, it is conduct. As I said in 2017, when I when I did my presentation at, at Mumbai, it is. Conductivity is very, very important, and as I've tried to make clear over the last couple of years, um, being paramagnetic is also very, very important. Okay, so here I have... On the left here, I have the same Amaza gas that we use to do funky business with the, the, the tungsten and transmute it. And it's blowing onto a 75 micron thin, like the thickness of a human hair, um, indium foil. 
Uh, and now indium is diamagnetic. I don't know why that's uh, stopped playing. There we go. Indium is diamagnetic. And so uh, it's it's moving away from the jet, but it turns to a jelly. It turns to a jelly, and it has a melting point of 156.6 degrees C. And it's only when clusters that, that are built up to a certain level interact with the indium and cause it to fission, and you get carbon and silicon and stuff, which we observed when this finally dropped to the ground and we examined it under the SEM that you get the thing heating up but even then it heated up like to brighter than you could possibly look at um and uh yeah so this to me was a, a total watershed experiment to see something that melts at such a low temperature hit with the same gas that supposedly just vaporized tungsten uh, and it just turns it to jelly and you can see it's like a rubber sheet it doesn't it doesn't drip it doesn't extend it just turns into a, like a rubber sheet and this is, I believe, the same kind of thing that was going on in the paramagnetic, in this case, aluminium, uh, to a certain depth uh, when Alec, uh, in John Hutchison's experiment. Apparently, this was glowing orange, and then he, uh, Alec Pazara came in, and, and you know it looked like it wasn't glowing orange anymore. He went to touch it. It felt cool to the touch, and he ended up by pushing his fingers and thumbs into the aluminium and leaving his fingerprints in there. So, metal forming was observed by Hutchison from 1979 onwards. Uh, Bearden's team observed this along with the uh, um, transmission of electricity in um, thin wires in Moscow in 1992. Um, there has been many failures in Lena and some devices that are not claimed to be the same process apparatus and, and so forth. Now, if you can imagine that your clusters are interacting with the electrons that uh, move around in the lattice in the metal bonds it's not a chemical bond it's not an ionic bond it's not a covalent bond these electrons just move around okay if you make them able to move around with greater ease or you know they're somehow disrupted in their strength of attraction to the atoms themselves then you know the slip process and bend process are in my view more likely to occur and um but they're still bound they're, they're not able to break in a sense so in my view uh, thinking along these lines explains the observations of alex pizarro what we observed with the mars gas touching onto um the indium 75 micron thin 156.6 degrees indium foil and it also explains um the Bearden's team observation in moscow Okay, then uh, matter transformation via cavitation. Uh, Kladoff observed uh, excess heat of two times, two to seven times in the 1980s. He awarded, he got patents awarded in 1992 again, like many of these Russian researchers. Transformation of elements, uh, that's it, both uh, synthesis, desynthesis, and conversion uh, from uh, fusion and fission and transmutation. Uh, so all under the bracket of transformation. Remediation is part of transmutation. Destruction of matter is desynthesis, and that is conversion to uh, field forms of energy, all talked about by Kladoff and verified later some of his work by the uh, uh, Russian chemical, biological, and nuclear remediation teams using the um, hydrowave technology in 1996 and 97, 1995-97. Um, other people have observed this, Stringham, Amaza, Leclerc, and myself, and most importantly, Bin Juin Huang. And what you see on the right side here in the perfect sacred geometry uh, basic 2D structure um, is that, uh, firstly, this material is exactly in this area. Uh, the main affected areas are completely within these two inner circles on either side. And then on inside the say, uh, the um, golden ratio line and inside the Vesica Pisces of the sacred geometry, uh, you have a magatama type shape and you have crystals of high highly enriched boron. This is something like, I think it's like uh, 50 or 60 percent maybe boron, no calcium in this point. And over here inside the golden ratio line and inside the Vesica Pisces curve, you have calcium with no boron now aluminium 
minus oxygen is boron. R bring the oxygen round to the other side and some isotopes of calcium are aluminium plus oxygen. It's oxygen through the Yang force stripped from the aluminium here in this vortex and sent round because of its paramagnetic nature to the other side and bound into the paramagnetic aluminium. Possibly, I don't know, that is my hypothesis. Okay, now down the bottom here uh, you can see um, that in this vortex pair on an Amasa vibrator steel plate again you have the triangle line coming down here you have two structures here that which are triangular they are literally triangular like that um, uh, brooch that we saw in the Helsinki Museum and how do you get triangular holes in the spinning vortex well that's because the substructures are fractal and what we see is iron is in orange and we have um, carbon in blue and uh, oxygen is in green inside this central structure in right in the center we have high oxygen levels and on the outside of this structure here we have the carbon around the outside in this wonderful kind of omega shape okay so like I said, the diamagnetic material gets thrown to the outside, the paramagnetic material or magnetic material, ferromagnetic uh, or so forth, gets uh, captured into the center with more ease. So uh, direct production of electricity, that is something that I very much would like to do. I think Henk Uren has possibly, um, I work on the Vega experiments, his um accidental discovery of what he called the hot tube and then we moved a tube down to the side and then he saw a, a bit of a glowing plasma ball so I said let's put a copper tube in there because copper produces copper oxide copper oxide is um uh how should we put this it is uh photoelectric so what I said was he was seeing this glowing and heating of the tube which was where he was pulling the vacuum from and I said well maybe what's happening is you've got some zinc oxide in there it's piezoelectric and it's uh, pyroelectric and because it's the also the cathode what might be happening is you're getting effectively what the ken shoulders generation method where you have some discharge down this end and as as it goes down it's actually emitting photons and the photons are producing more electrons and so it actually creates a lot of um uh, electrons in the tube uh, producing a big plasmoid or, or uh, exotic vacuum object and I, I was describing that this might be the same way that is it going in the way that the multi-layered cathode worked because of the gaps and the resonant chambers and so forth so um, I, I suggested then let's let's have a tube and he was already on the case somewhere else on on the reactor uh, more close to the anode or, or opposite the anode and then um, to insert a copper pipe in there because it's more conductive um, uh, and it has this property of having um, uh, copper oxide which is nearly as good as yttrium. I said if you wanted to do this properly you would probably uh, coat the inside of it with yttrium. Um, and using this the, there are various methods that you can directly produce electricity. The one that I've described is this drift tube and so on with shoulders I've done that in the past the Klimov method where he, he spent time with Ken shoulders and he came up with this device where he had a Tesla coil producing a um, plasma inside the vortex gas flow this is very similar to the N gates uh, system but um, uh, additionally he had a target containing a neutron absorber that's something like boron or indium or gadolinium or or, or um, cadmium um, cadmium cadmium maybe uh, just check that later. Uh, might got that wrong. Um, and and then he has these uh, because it forms these um, channels of positive and negative dissociation within the vortex. You can put a probe in there and extract electricity directly from that. Um, that is patented, as far as I understand. Solin's method is to create a coherent con uh, vortex of um, matter and use an inductive. Uh, coil around that and I believe that what has been created here by Henk 
uh, uh, I think that if people work with us, I think we have a reasonable chance of making a direct electricity generator based on variations of this principle. And then the Chukhanov method is to create an, a massive ball lightning and then magnetically stress it. This will emit light and the photons can be converted into electricity. So it's not quite direct, direct electricity generation, uh, unlike the Klimov method and the Shoulders method and the Solin method, um, but it's near as damn it. Um, and so uh, I'm going to play this video now and uh, you will see the beauty here. But essentially we have a torus at the end. And we have the cone feeding into the center of the tor torus, and it is really rather stable. This, for me, is one of the most beautiful things that I have seen in this research since the beginning in 2011. And I think that if we are able to find uh, the right resources uh, and the right amount of time in the right circumstance, um, uh, we will be able to create a direct electricity generation for this. When you see the flash, that is where it becomes destabilized and it shoots off to the anode and, and leaves one of those little marks that we were looking at earlier, which shows us that the structure of these things is this fractal toroidal structure. But it is stable for seconds at a time and, and it almost instantaneously reforms. Uh, that it's moving about a lot because Henk is having to look through the window at an angle with the camera zoomed in and uh, he's got no tripod so that's just how it is but for me this is just just totally awesome it's just totally totally awesome well done Henk Okay, so we have propulsion, we have uh, direct electricity generation, we have uh, cold metal forming, we have matter, matter manipulation on a wide range and scales uh, for uh, engineering processes. Um, we have communication, we have sadly, possibly, uh, mind reading and mind control. Um, uh, you know, the, the unbelievable uh, properties of um, this particular structure and uh, what it can do i mean it's literally a step change in what humanity's possibilities are and uh some notes on this uh this is a very important paper by afanasev and dubovic some remarkable charge current configurations and this is from the joint institute for nuclear research in dubna and this is page 937 uh, and it's showing the toroid here and a, a selection of electrons coming over from over here, the magnetic time-dependent Aronhoff bomb effect. For the charge current configuration discussed in the text, the time-dependent magnetic flux differs from zero only inside the impenetrable torus T. Outside T, the independent of time electric strength E differs from zero only inside the torus hole. It is the time-dependent magnetic flux inside T that leads to the time variation of the intensity of the scattered charged particles. There we go. So... It has the Aronhoff bomb effect caused by the phase singularity in the center. I rest my case. Um, toroidal moment, toroidal moment produces Aronhoff bomb effect, AB effect. Dubovic et al. Electrons have a toroidal moment. First proof of the nuclear toroidal moment, Anapol in West was in 1997 with cesium by Wood et al. And it has a 7 plus 2 moment. So there is a toroidal moment in spin matter it, not just ha negative half spin matter as uh, electrons have as shown here this slide also shows you that cesium atoms with a spin of seven over two positive uh, also has a toroidal moment in the form of an anapole um, so therefore i am saying that spin nuclei interact as they have their own toroidal moment the Aronhoff bomb effect can cause matter wave phase synchronization and coherence at any temperature. And to understand that, you need to look, look at the awarded Lockheed Martin US patent uh, uh, systems and methods for generating coherent matter waves. So, um, the food for this is any spin matter. That is neutrons, protons, charged and uncharged leptons, and ultimately quarks. So if you get the toroidal moment able to reach right into the center, I mean, Bearden goes as far as the nucleus, I'm going as far as the quarks. I think this can reach right into and manipulate the quarks. 
Um, so, for instance, uh, these will work on relic background or cold, you know, low energy neutrinos. These are all the same things. Electrons, uh, hydrogen, and nuclei with spin. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, just electrons and hydrogen get you quite far with this. So, um, again, the Amasa vibrator uh, is a reference point here. Um, and this helped me understand what was going on in Bin Zhuan Huang's and make the proposal to him. So, non-spin bosonic nuclei is the main product. We, this is why I believe you don't see so much tritium, so much 3 helium. You see mostly 4 helium in cold fusion experiments. That is 99.99999% of helium. Uh, it's alpha, actually alpha. And this is diamagnetic. It gets released from the system because it is diamagnetic. Whereas tritium actually is a, a, a spin matter. Um, but anyway, um, it's the diamagnetic nature that gets it kicked out. The next diamagnetic element is uh, isotope is 12 carbon. Uh, of significance is 12 carbon. And this is 98.89% of carbon. And it's tri-alpha, again, it's an alpha conjugate nuclei. And this is diamagnetic. It gets thrown to the outside. It gets thrown to the outside. Remember all those large clusters that I showed you at the beginning in Hank Uren's experiment? It's thrown to the outside. Remember the, the cavitation mark left on indium from the uh, Amasa vibrator plate projection of whatever it was that it was projecting? They were circular holes with carbon or dark patches on the outside, I, I suspect, to carbon. Then the next one is 16 oxygen. And this is 99.759% of oxygen. It's quad alpha. Again, it's alpha conjugate. But uniquely, this one is synthesized, let's say, but it is now paramagnetic. It's paramagnetic. In fact, the only thing that oxygen can ox oxidize with, like, well, it can only be oxidized by itself. And both monoatomic oxygen and uh, diatomic oxygen is... Uh, uh, paramagnetic so in all cases it's paramagnetic okay and so it really wants to be in the center as observed here and so oxygen is the hook on which the other magnetic clusters aggregate okay and whether they are formed by uh, hydrogen electrons or whatever they come into this central core and do the funky business okay so I proposed that uh, Oxygen-17 is most favorably formed uh, and is the most likely outcome because you start with most of oxygen containing 16 oxygen in water, okay? You obviously have protons in water and you obviously have an electron in water. All you need is the antineutrino. The antineutrino could be caused by the 5,000 uh, degrees centigrade that's formed by uh, uh, reentrant jets in cavitation. Or it could be formed, sorry, it could be uh, captured by the toroidal moment in the vortex uh, in uh, the cavitation process. Either way, we need an antineutrino coming in to create a proton simultaneously fusing. All this happens at the same pro time instantaneously in this magic little box um, and comes out as 17 oxygen. And then 17 oxygen is not only paramagnetic but it is also spin 5 plus 2 okay so we had 7 plus 2 on the cesium with the toroidal moment the, the uh, uh, 17 oxygen will have uh, has spin so it double wants to be in there it doesn't only want to be in there because it's oxygen and it's paramagnetic but it also has a toroidal moment so it the oxygen is 17 oxygen is the most likely thing to be formed from the starting material and it is then really 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 wanting to be in the center of the toroidal moment uh, and the most likely energetic product to come out of this is 12 carbon which is diamagnetic and 22 neon which is diamagnetic here diamagnetic diamagnetic so they get thrown to the outside so my proposal was that using water in a cavitation process, he would see the production of 17 oxygen and the 17 oxygen will lead to the production of carbon and 22 neon. That is precisely what he saw. In my initial comment on this a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, whenever it was, I suggested he would see 21 over, uh, neon over 22 neon because I made the mistake of reading my own table from the bottom up rather than top down, uh, thus negating my own theory as presented in my poster session at ICCF 22 in 2019. 
However, he came back after eight months, nine months, a year or whatever and said, we didn't find any 20, we didn't find any 21, but we did find 22 by different methods. And uh, and I said, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, you should have found 22. So for me, it was much better that he wasn't trying to goal seek uh, what I told him. He was actually, he actually found the only thing that it should have done, which is this 12C by uh, uh, 22 Neon. So in my view, um, uh, fusion and fission and transmutation from the point of view so so this is effectively fusion but it's multi-body fusion this is four different particles coming together simultaneously right because if you produce a neutron first firstly you need uh, 0.7 something uh, M -ele M mega electron volts to overcome the energy barrier and then you also need uh, you should expect to see a gamma ray coming from when the neutron goes into the the 16 oxygen if you if you have these happen all simultaneously you do not see the gamma and you do not need the energy barrier and this is energy positive so it will occur and this is energy positive so it can occur so um uh, this for me proves conclusively that uh, uh, and 100% certainly in my view if he has certainly verified the neon and he verified it with using get this he used the same people that do the gas analysis for the semiconductor industry in Taiwan. I don't think there's any people better on planet Earth. They took the samples. They used their own processes to verify this. And finally, he concluded with a, um, a, uh, a flame test the, the color of neon in the gases produced. So I think this is absolutely categorically true if he's seen the neon 22. Uh, of course, we need to do more verification. The other thing was that uh, Bin Jun Hang only saw the production of 17 oxygen and 22 neon and carbon in what was uh, in reactors that produced excess heat. The, sorry, the non-condensable gases of CO, O17, O, O17, uh, and um, neon 22, and those gases were only observed in the reactors that produced excess heat and so therefore i think we can conclusively say that uh, um, this process is going on if neon 22 is confirmed to exist right so uh, the, the same process uh, goes on later so you often see magnesium synthesized but it is a fuel itself so it goes on to produce other elements um, Silicon gets produced and gets dumped out. This has been observed by many people. It's diamagnetic. Sulfur gets uh, blown out of ball lightning at the end of its demise. Why? It's diamagnetic. Okay. So, I want to thank my family uh, for putting up with me working in this field for so long. Uh, and I want to thank all the donors to remoteview.icu. That really has helped me over the last several years and the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project donors, which, you know, if that hadn't happened, these various experimenters might not have been able to do the things they've done over the years. I might not have been able to do the things that I've done. Um, independent researchers working with and inside the MFMP. It is so important that these researchers come to us. They share what they have and uh, in an open fashion, unrestricted, and and we're able to analyze samples from the reactors and so forth. And people that worked with with us directly, particularly people like Alan Goldwater, fi my fellow director, Hank Guren, um, David Boutlier, Tony Giovanni, and Artifact, thank you very much. So, And also to Charles Goren and many, many more that have made this possible. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see the sacred geometry, the 2D O, uh, where only inside the D4D level structure do you see the distortion. You have the uh, Visa Capisces clearly marked out, the carbon deposits on one side, not so much on the other side. This ring is here, and the lower disruption zone, which I will talk about in a separate presentation, is incredibly remarkable. The difference between this area and the area just outside, and how much it is exactly in line with what has been observed in the sample from 1980 by John Hutchison. This, in my view, there is coherent matter passing through here, and the, the sim, what you see under here, is very clear of a, a sign that a superfluid is passing through here. Okay, the the sacred geometry, the 
uh, O structure is exactly on here with the Sothic triangle and so forth. And, and so again, on one side, uh, you see uh, a very different kind of layout to the other. Now, I've talked about this in the past, um, and um, I've overlaid for the first time for this presentation the sacred geometry. And you can see, as I speculated, the top of this part of the tour, okay, uh, exactly aligns with the uh, top of the vessel here with the center lines coming here. This is the center of the end tour, okay? And um, uh, the disruption zone is where these two things cross over down the bottom here. He has the particles coming up and the particles going around and the particles on this side of the uh, uh, one vortex shape and the, the particles are, you can't see on this side. But anyway... Um, very, very accurately done. Well done, Mr. Tesla. Thank you for your little gift that passed forward into the future. Then here is Alien Scientist drawing. I've overlaid the 200 million year old uh, ammonite. And then I've got Tesla here, both Tesla before and Tesla after. Tesla logo is the same as the um, uh, the Yukon of Asara. I've overlaid a couple of other structures here. Now, um, as I've said before, the caduceus beam comes down further. Uh, when I was thinking about the the way that this is structured on the Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower before, I, I thought that the, the triangle comes down. It still comes within the line, but I thought this is the disruption area here where the ball is when this is correctly aligned here. This is the disruption area. And I thought this has to be significant. Uh, with regard to Tesla's device, because in exactly the disruption area, he has when you when it goes around the loop. Exactly. When it goes around the loop, he has the connections to the uh, secondary coil. Exactly. Now, I thought maybe he says something in his pattern, and this was after I did that graphic for the presentation. Maybe he says something in his patent. So I went to his um, Wardenclyffe Tower 1914 patent, and I literally could not believe it. You can go and look at it yourself, but I'm paraphrasing here right now. It says that if you move this point D a little bit down, just a little bit down, it will produce a large ball of fire, which is incredibly destructive and will destroy the apparatus or something like that. What are the chances of that? <laughs> it literally says something to that effect in the patent. Go and read it for yourself. I was totally and utterly blown away. He says that if you move the contact point here a little bit down from here, you'll create a big ball of fire and it will destroy the apparatus. Right? I didn't go back in time and tell Tesla to put that into his 1914 patent. I didn't do that. I didn't go back in time and do that, right? <laughs> but that is implying to me that it's either a yin or yang and the, the moment would appear here. But as I show you with the, the Henk Urian, the, the, the caduceus vortex, the, the ability to extract energy uh, projects down and the Sothic triangle, even when it's arranged like this, does not go outside. And this resolved another major, major issue for me. Where I'd originally aligned the Sothic Triangle, if that was really going down that far, then there would be a problem with the um, with the event horizon. But in this case, there is no problem because the event horizon is drawn from the center point to the bottom of the uh, this circle and all the way around, which means that above the areas where humans can go, where the windows are in the tower, and well above head height, the the impenetrable zone, if it was highly energized, is, is present. So if you go to the tower here, look, th these are the areas with the windows. Like, um, I think when this is running, it will be perfectly safe because the thing that's uh, present in the pyramid um, which they guard against with the granite blocks, um, is not interacting here. So that circle there. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I, I dare anyone to go and look at the quote, but it really is that. So thank you very much, DIY Projects with Chalksis. That's very kind of you uh, for the Aussie $10 there. That's a, I'll treat myself to something tomorrow. <laughs> or maybe I won't because it goes to, to the MFMP, but there we go. But thank you anyway. Um, yeah, so um, and last up, I have got uh, to share this. Uh, photo with Dr. Takaaki Matsumoto. It was a real pleasure to share the Henk Urine uh, carbon carbonized film with an iron ball, like his carbonized film with an iron ball. Uh, the uh, uh, that I found on the eastern plateau. Sorry, yeah, eastern plateau of the Vega Valley. The exact same structure found as an impact mark on the aluminium inside of the supernova reactor. The iron-rich crenelated sphere and the impact mark almost identical to that observed uh, by Takaki Matsumoto. This is on the quartz liner and this is on the eastern plateau of the Vega Valley. The same bubble-like structures as observed in um, his work in 1993 but on a Mars of vibrator plates. The structures observed in Neil Crichton Gold's um, Lion Reactor, these two here, two separate ones, uh, and also in Parkamov's uh, boron nitride uh, uh, material as he observed this tornado structure behind the ball lightning. Um, so it was a real pleasure, it was great loss to have lost him, but uh, it's, it, it's an honor to have been able to um, verify his work before he passed and uh, there we go there is our iron rich crenelated sphere in the center of the structure silicon dark side uh, you know diamagnetic on the outside um, this calcium here these fragments of calcium here I question whether these are all part of a large torus that was around the outside okay um, because it's calcium oxide that produces the torus and it has a magnetic core. And the reason I'm saying that is because um, if you look at the paper uh, funded by literally everyone in the world, um, this one, it has the magnetic structure around here, but it also has the magnetic core. Okay, So my hypothesis currently is that the calcium oxide calcium being paramagnetic, oxygen being paramagnetic, are the torus that does the work. And if you do enough work, you end up with a, a iron-rich crenelated sphere in the middle. And because material is pulled into that, nuclear reactions will occur in there and material is sprayed out of that. And the um, so the, the calcium oxide structures are here. And you may see uh, iron-rich crenelated sphere in the middle. I'm not certain about that, um, uh, but that is my best guess, given this blown-up structure with all these chunks of, of uh, calcium on the outside here. And we know from the ultra-vibrator experiments that the um, silicon dioxide is normally which this and this is is normally on the outside of the iron uh, sphere so that my friends is uh, fractal toroidal moment practical applications my name is bob greenier and i'm a volunteer with the martin fleischmann memorial project if people want a summary they can go and look at my presentation given on uh, the 31st of August 2023 at ICCF 25 in Stitton. Right. Um, I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to take a quick break now. And I'm going to go downstairs and see if I'm locked into the building. If I'm locked into the building, then I'll come upstairs and take some questions. So you can uh, see this as uh, <laughs> interim. I'll be back in a, in a few minutes uh, either way. And uh, uh, we'll see what happens.
So, uh, the bad news is I'm locked in the building, so I'm sleeping in the office tonight. The good news is I can take some of your questions. <laughs> So, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to do it. Tony Giboni says, thanks, Bob. Awesome work. Thank you very much for all of your efforts. Right, have you checked out the inertial mass of gravitational mass from T.T. Brown? No, I haven't. Okay, so the water along wire metal cutting device, would it create life force, energy, ambient, or suck it? Um, I don't think, so in those instances, I don't think the the structures are living long enough to create any, um, it's, it's not like a resonant phenomena. These are initial sparks and they're moving and so forth. So, very very unlikely i i think um you know you have to work a little bit harder um to do those more worrying things like i say the, these things have got a lot of engineering applications where it doesn't get too nasty So, do you have a pillow and a blanket? Yes, I do, actually. Uh, it's actually quite hot in here anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so, Curtis on said, have you heard of the Bright Wheeler process? No, I haven't. Sorry. Um, but maybe I should. Uh did I learn anything? Harry asks, did I learn anything interesting at ICCF? Yes, I did. There was um, a guy called, uh, he was from Ukraine, and he dialed in. And um, where are we? Um, I don't want to get his name wrong, so let me just find that. Basically, he took the... A Parkonov, Parkonov, Zhigolov style of detector, and um, let me see. Uh, okay, his guy, the guy was called Alexei Ivanchuk, and he um, he took a normal CD and used it as a detector, but he used a candle and coated it with soot. And I just thought, oh, God, why didn't I think about that? That's absolutely complete inspired genius. And why do I say that? It's because I predicted immediately what he was going to show. As I've told you, the structures are intensely magnetic inside, and then they have this event horizon outside of which there's not any magnetism at all. And so I predicted that as the structures would come in and collide with the disc it would plow it like a like a snow plow like a like a, a dozer would and he then showed the next slide and it was just like boom nailed it <laughs> and it was just like someone had plowed up this literally like a dozer had pushed all this soil up in front of it and with these tracks and then he showed these other style of tracks where there was a little bit of stuff on the outside and there was more stuff in the middle, right? And I go, well, in that case, it's it's because it's the other EH and it's not come down flat, it's come down sideways and gone along. And then there were the other style of tracks where the carbon arranged itself into little tendrils. And I thought, well, what's happened there is it's blown up and, and it's released all the electrons and it's charged the carbon and the carbon have then gone electrostatically and arranged themselves. So that was absolutely beautiful by Alexei Ivanchuk. And um, and I, I, when he said it, I, I mean, you'll see whenever the things get published, I, I, I couldn't believe that I hadn't thought of it. But, you know, there we go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so uh, Kelly McRaven says, what size hard rock material do you think could be fed into a wind hox hex? I I have all metals, 150 micron. Um, the wind hex, certainly when they're smashing up concrete to remake it into reused concrete, they're putting in chunks, I guess, the size of a lemon or something. But of course, it depends on the um, the strength of the particular rock. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, you're just going to have to suck it and see. But first, we have to get one um, working to the degree that the commercial devices from Air Grinder are able to do. And, uh, you know, then then we'll be able to explore other things. Uh, what do you think uh, is the most important discovery here for humanity? Well, firstly, I don't think any of these things are particularly discoveries. They're relearning what we probably were already using. Um, I, I think the ability to synthesize matter, or rather transform matter, from non-physical matter into physical matter, through different types of physical matter and out into non-physical matter, in a relatively easy way, in in a way that um, might even be able to feed itself energy-wise, um, uh, but that is self-regulating, such that if you if you kind of switched it off or it got too if it gets too vigorous, it will break the thing that's controlling it, and and if it's not controlled, it, it'll then stop doing what it's doing. So it's like it has a lot of ways to fail safe and so the ability to create elements you need it, it, it's it, there's no good being able to travel to another solar system if they don't have all the elements for life right um obviously propulsion and propulsion that gets round uh relativity i think is incredibly important uh, you don't need to generate electricity if you can lift a million tons of water to the top of a mountain and, and then let it run down through your hydroelectric dam. You, you, you know, as, so, as soon as you've got the ability to remove the action of the thing that causes gravity uh, on matter, um, you have immense potential. Um, I think that probably... Or, or the direct electricity generation. Um, I don't know. It's just it's too too difficult to fathom, really. Into, I mean, the instantaneous communication will be necessary when we are a multi when when we are recognised to be a multi um, galactic or multi solar system species. Um, I, honestly, I think the the most important thing that this technology would ultimately allow is the ability to create our own solar systems and to um, and to pause time so that then we could make use of the devices created, uh, the 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 solar systems created. Uh, did I see the YouTube I send you? I don't know what you're referring to. No, sorry. Uh, Paul Eline is saying, Bob, what are you planning to do next? I, I genuinely would like to, uh, well, f firstly, I need to, um, uh, do more study of Hutchison samples, um, and, and get that book out. Um, I want to do the posters for the the Vega Valley. Um, I I need to create tools that you guys can then go around and you can show in a visual way that this is a real thing and it does magic. Um, and you know because I can only do so much, and it, we need an army of people <laughs> um, that understand and uh can share the information really um direct electricity I, would, I, I my first priority was to do radiation remediation but my whole experience with 
trying to get proposals um through nine sigma about the fukushima daiichi that you know they changed the rules to exclude our proposal so like i'm a bit coming to terms with with um the fact that they like a problem and they like the problem to be expensive in long term so uh, since you can't fix that problem then you got you got to you're not allowed to fix that problem i think i think uh, direct electricity generation is 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 a really good problem to solve Quartz monazite with cerium, lanthanum, neo, para, and thorium. Um, well, I, I mean, the the quartz will, you know, it, if it works like it does with normal silicon dioxide, um, it smashes it up. Uh, the monazite that I had in Kerala was fairly brittle, actually. Um getting the Syrian lanthanum out would be of high value yeah and of course the the, the thorium I did find that when I put a, a Marza gas on the thoriated tungsten rods that the thorium just basically um just went went and pulled itself into a big blob even though it was just like two percent or whatever let me just look at the property of thorium it might be that it's diamagnetic and it gets out of the way um in which case uh, if you you're looking to um refine thorium for you know thorium reactors that that would be useful it might explain what why we observed there as well um thorium 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 it's a lovely element thorium hmm no thorium is actually paramagnetic so it should become a fuel but um has it got sp ah. doesn't have spin really or oh, maybe it's not shown it might be okay there must be some reason why it was not um being damaged in the way that the tungsten was and it seemed to be pulling so yeah, it might work for that. It depends how brittle it is. Certainly, the stuff that from Kerala that I looked at was um, very brittle. I lift one million tons of water and drop it on the forest fires. Well, yeah, of course you, you might you might want to make it spray on forest fires, <laughs> drop it from a very big height, actually. I, I do recall looking at Angel Falls. I was lucky enough to go there, and it's about a kilometre high, and the, the water never gets to the bottom. It just breaks up. Okay, so Curtis Horn. Bob, we should chat sometime. I'm working with Jim Woodward on the Mac effect and theory. There might be parallels in what you're doing here. How do we connect? Um just sign up to remoteview.icu curtis and um send a message via that so that's remoteview.icu or you can use the uh comment um email or whatever it is uh, on um re um quantumheat.org Can you speak more on how time is affected with and around the structure? Okay, Mini J. Um, what I'm saying is that there is, if I go to the slide, um, so basically, if relic neutrinos are the thing that keeps electrons spinning, and what we know from Xu and Zhu's work in from 1988 to 1999 that in three body alignments where there will be an increased flux of relic neutrinos lensed from the cosmos 
not that he discussed that, there are changes in the rate of decay of rubidium-87 and cesium-137 atomic clocks. And since they work on beta decay, and if you had a change in the flux of relic neutrinos, that would, uh, through inverse beta decay, change their rate of decay. Um, if you create sort of like um, energized water, for instance, with corona discharges, and you give that to plants, they tend to grow faster. Okay, so they're able to perform their chemical divisions and their chemical synthesis faster. Um, why? 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 When do you have an electric thunderstorm? Does all of your vegetables go absolutely bonkers? As does the weeds. Um, I think it's because not only is the nitrogen fixation from the air, there's also this etheric matter clusters that get bound to the oxygen that then comes in with the water and goes into the plant. So it's an accelerant. If you completely remove this, then you shut down time. And so what I understand is that the the thing that causes gravity is the same thing. Uh, uh, and because of the way it gets absorbed by matter and it passes through matter, it also is the cause of inertia. And the sphere that forms around this geometry structure, which I will show you here, um, if it will show me, it will show me. Is it doing it? Is it going to do it? It's being very slow. <laughs> Come on. There we go. All right. I don't know why it's put it in the middle of the frame. Okay. So this sphere that forms around here, um, I don't believe the, the neutrinos can pass through there. So once you've used them up inside, time will stop. But also, um, because your consciousness is uh and your ca access to the akashic record propagates through the same um quantum coherent substance that goes through the entire cosmos you're in a situation where you will also lose um consciousness um and i believe that this would also occur in maybe some sort of craft that that are using this same principle unless you can become that there's a certain zone where you can somehow get get enough flux from the outside and transmit through it. Like, so you you might have to position yourself in a very specific place, or not drive the system too hard, or maybe take breaks so that you get little blips of time exposure um, as you are traveling, or something like that. Was was that answering your questions? I don't I don't know whether it's answering your questions, is it? Um, around the structure I think around the structure we're outside of the fuzzy area so if you look at my background here these these are a whole bunch of uh, impact marks and um, there, there is this fuzzy area around the outside I think things would be a bit weird in that area a bit messed up but uh, uh, outside of that I don't think there would be anything that other than normal time. Uh, commercial coherent matter detectors. Um, I, 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 it's the toroidal moment detectors, and I, I, and what I want to see Brian Josephson about is to say, look, you know, what is the simplest Josephson junction device we can create that then we can. Um, you know, capture or convert to a simple uh, phase or amplitude modulation signal that, so that then when we're running an experiment, we can bring these devices closer to it and see what the effect is. You know, it would be amazing to, like, you know, have a cavitation experiment, you turn it on and suddenly you can't detect anything by anything, but by the, the Josephson Junction system you can see a, a, a amplitude or phase relationship going on uh, on a scope or something and then you can hone the frequencies to maybe enhance that and, and tune to a point where you're getting maximum toroidal moments generated by the system you're doing and it might just be a simple thing as pouring, pouring a little bit water in or taking some out so that you get the the um, phase conjugation the 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 uh, standing waves correct 
And the same thing would apply to generating standing waves in a fluid, or sorry, a metal or whatever. The brain, I'm pretty convinced, is good at detecting these things. But what I would like to be able to do is to have a Josephson Junction based device connected run run the experiments and then see how i feel at the same time and and correlate the the what i feel with the measured with with the time when you're getting the most effect if you know what i mean and then you could ap- actually have a guide where every human becomes a, in tune to when the toroidal moments are being generated and i i think that they will find that these times will be also when they're exposed to a very charismatic individual or a faith healer or you know these people when they walk into a room and you you can feel that that the, their energy what is that or is what you're feeling your um, ability to connect with them through the toroidal moments So suppose a fractal toroid wave could be unwound into a frequency domain chart to see the spectrum and possibly peak frequency component relationships. Imagine you had a thousand level fractal toroid and each of them have their own up and down amplitude and frequency and uh, toroidal precession angle and frequency of variation of that and processional frequency um for each of the thousand tiers and each each tier has an, anything from two to 48 sub sub tall levels the variation in the three-dimensional um, modulation of all of these different levels of um information storage is just it's just mind-boggling, the permutations. It's just mind-boggling. And so you might just have to settle for the first level or a couple of levels down. And maybe you would be able to, over time, distinguish between, you know, a, a two-tor N-tor, a two-sub-tor two N-tor, and a three-sub-tor N-tor, or a four-sub-tor N-tor. Um and you know it might take a lot more effort to go even a couple of levels down thanks seven on the congratulations uh thank you for your comment bo grizzly Yeah, the the wind hex, depending on your brittleness, uh, Kelly, of your source might might solve the the particle uniformity and size. Uh, proton anti neutrino and electron. Uh, equals neutron not neutrino yeah ken pratt's right about wind hex can also separate magnetics or rather it, it gives magnetic properties to certain things and so you can separate them that way um, so seven one says, "Is time travel possible with this tech?" I don't believe time travel is possible, uh, except relatively. So um, I don't mean in the relativity sense. I mean relatively. So when you're in the bubble, time relatively stops for you, which means you don't age and your consciousness doesn't process because all of those things are stopped um, or drastically slowed. Um, but normal time will persist outside of the bubble. So 
if you're in a bubble for a thousand years, you might have aged a very small amount of time. And when you come out, you're effectively in the future. I don't see any way to go back. Um, however, when you come out, you might be able to go into the device at a lower energy level and use its ability potentially to, um, in a different mode, like the Integratron or similar devices, to uh, accelerate your own ability to use your own toroidal moments and amplify that and be able to remote view across time and space to see what happened whilst you were in stasis, as it were. So you could catch up potentially on key events that occurred whilst you were uh, not aging. So it's a relatively relative thing going forward in time. So thanks, Kelly. Um, um, you know, if I was a company that had a logo that looked something like this, which might be something that looked like, uh, where is it? <laughs> You know, some, someone who had a company that had a logo that looked like, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, Tesla's Tesla's tower here. You know, this sort of uh, Ukonofsara shape. You know, I might, I might have a company that would uh, deal in vertical takeoff and landing craft or, um, you know, that might, might employ the fact that this can instantaneously liquefy rock and uh make a tunnel com tunneling company or i you know i might use the fact that um understanding this process might give me the ability to interact and read the mind or control the mind at a distance so i might have a business that would look at um somehow connecting with the mind you know these kind of things that would all stem out of the same technology family um you know it might be something one might set a company up to do and uh, there would be no better no better representation than to have uh, something that looked like the Econa Fasara as the my logo that you know exactly matched where the uh, tails linked in with the vortex structure and the base linked in with the base of the uh, Visa Capisces. Yeah, the, there would be no better logo to use. Uh, isn't the toroidal moment the forbidden apple? No, we ate the forbidden apple, um, Felix. It, it, it might be the understanding that the forbidden apple gives you which we already innately have. It's written in our face. <laughs> it's it's literally in our face. <laughs> you know, it's in our face. <laughs> we have the technology encoded in our face. Felix is asking, did I read the Otis Key T car book? No. Um, has there been any work? Uh, well, uh, Mini, Mini J is asking, has there been any computational simulation so you can do more experiments in a shorter period of time? Well, I, I can say that, like, if you go and look at this paper that I reference here, which essentially was proving the prior 1976 work that was forming the basis of the NASA intergalactic travel paper, which is a, which is a real hoot to read, actually. And given the fact that everything they're talking about um, 
is what they're talking about in Congress meetings <laughs> recently as if it's something new. Um, yeah, so this this paper here, um, they used a supercomputer uh, in China, one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. It, this was funded by the US Department of Energy. It was funded by the European Union, by the UK. Uh, it was funded by China, Japan, and South Korea. So there is things that we can still all work on. And um, uh, what it found was something that verified the work from 1976. But they also found these trillions of volts per meter. And they also got the flow structure, which is the flow that we observe. So, uh, But the ultra experiment, you can conduct an experiment in as little as 90 seconds. And uh, that is that experiment uh, here. This is... Uh, in deionized water, aluminium foil, and uh, it would appear we synthesized boron and calcium. And only calcium on this side, and only boron on that side, so, you know. You see the uh, event horizon here around the plasma. And this is the crumb picture of a collapsing water bubble. And this is the actual bubble before it collapses in a plasma discharge underwater, producing this sphere radius, which seems to occur. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Kelly McRaven, yeah, you, you put things in and they come out a range of sizes but i mean it depends you know on the pressure of the gas the temperature the charge um but these are parameters we need to work on understanding more um we need to first achieve the things that have already been achieved and then work from there so um you know there's a lot of work we can do to uh first um and then but what 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 is being claimed by the um air grinder people is that it does magnetize some materials and then then you can use that for separation that's the specific claim yeah you could use specific gravity to separate other things out you might even be able to use centrifusion centrifugal stuff to separate stuff out Bob, would electronic water descaling devices that affix inclined water pipes be affecting the water with toroidal moment? Um, uh, if they create cavitation, yes. If they have high um, uh, how should we put this? Uh, high uh, what did I say? I'm getting tired now. <laughs> um, turbulence. If they have high turbulence, they're going to get it. So, where is it? Um, somewhere. No, it's maybe it's further on. Anyway, high turbulence. So, if you have high turbulence, you're going to get something. Particularly when you have um, high turbulence next to, say, water that has um, is in contact with metals, which is hydrophilic, or something else that's hydrophilic produces charge separation in the water, and easy water, and then when with the turbulence you end up producing the same structure. Um, seven one said, "Do you know if Tesla mentioned anything about transmutation? He definitely, um, well, he should have seen transmutation. Uh, I need to check on that, but essentially, his his carbon button light bulb was the first atom smasher. Essentially, huge acceleration fields and stuff, and he produced uh, X rays." <laughs> Uh, 
So Ken Pratt says the Sapphire team used some sort of experiment result feedback software to speed up their time frame. Well, um, essentially, if you have, uh, they had a spectrometer so they could see what gases were being produced. And if if you tweak a parameter and more gases get produced, then you know you're <laughs> tweaking the right parameter. So whether that was field strength or pressure or whatever um you know they had those different parameters okay so i'm going to say thank you very much for your time uh, i'm going to try and sleep here in the office <laughs> ah. and uh, uh i commend to you a sea of opportunity provided by the practical applications of the fractal toroidal moment. And uh, I hope humanity plays safe with this and it isn't just uh, nonsense that's created with it. Because uh, I think we are on the verge of the dawning of an old age. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Good night, buenas noches, dobro noches.